remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. The invocation this evening will be offered by Zulfat Suara, Chairman of the American Muslim Advisory Council and who serves on Metro Action Commission, the guest of Councilmember Mina Johnson. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Dear God, Lord of the heavens and the earth, we first express our gratitude for allowing us to congregate here today and to be with each other's company. We thank you for our lives, for our health, and for our elected officials. Dear Lord, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, we call upon you to guide and guard our mayor, the vice mayor, and all council members in their decisions. Help them to make decisions that is best for Nashvilleans. Nashville is growing, with many moving in daily. Unfortunately, we have too many within our systems who are alive, but they are not living. Many are homeless, without health care, many barely making ends meet. Dear Lord, help our leaders remember that as leaders, they are servants. Help them to serve all of Nashville citizens in the best way possible. Lord, we ask you to keep the passion for justice burning in them. May you help them follow the footsteps of those who without fear and without hesitation stand in the name of justice. Let justice and fairness be a hunger that invigorates them and keep them steadfast on the path to improving our society. Lord, keep them, O oh Lord, in your care and guide them to all that is pleasing to thee. Amen. Amen. Our pleasure. You may be seated. Without objection, we're going to suspend the calling of the roll and ask that the clerk record the names of those members present throughout the meeting. Is there a motion for the adoption of the minutes of the meeting August 7, 2018? Without objection, the minutes of the meeting will stand approved as written. Madam Clerk, are there any messages from the mayor? No, Madam President, there are no messages from the mayor. Thank you. We have a presentation. Council members Kendall and Karen Johnson. It's Miss Sandra K. Brown. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, Council Lady Haywood and Vircher and uh, everybody that's been involved with the African Street Festival. All those who have been involved with the African Street Festival, Council Lady Erica Gilmore, <laughs> can you please join us? Uh, Councilman Jonathan Hall, I know you've worked with the African Street Festival. Yes. <laughs> okay. You gonna start out now? This is a resolution number RS twenty eighteen dash twelve eighty four. This is a resolution recognizing and honoring Sandra K. Brown, where Sandra K. Brown has been a strong figure of the influence and inspiration to the Nashville community for 16 years. And whereas Ms. Brown, a business financial analyst, has volunteered as the chief financial officer for the African American Cultural Alliance for over 10 years. And whereas the AACA was founded in 1983 by several African American community members in Nashville, Tennessee, and is an organization committed to celebrating and connecting the extensions of Africa to America by way of education, arts, business, family, and community. Yeah. And whereas Ms. Brown has raised thousands of dollars through her grant writing and notable fundraising expertise, and has diligently worked to obtain donations from various sponsors on behalf of the AACA. And whereas Ms. Brown executes many tasks such as creating budgets, organizing volunteer committees, acquiring vendors, collecting payments, and distributing packets of information on behalf of the African American Cultural Alliance. 
And whereas in addition, Ms. Brown also performs secretarial duties such as responding to inquiries and scheduling all AACA black history tours for universities, businesses, high schools, and church groups, and Whereas, Ms. Brown also serves as the African American Cultural Alliance Assistant Tour Director and is often called upon to provide information and educational resources to constituents. And whereas, Ms. Brown assists with the development of annual Kwanzaa programs and actively involves the African American Cultural Alliance, and whereas doing AACA events, Ms. Brown supervises volunteer staff, and maintains both the AAC office and headquarters tent for customer services, vendor check-ins, security patrols, and city code compliance, and Whereas it is, <clears throat> whereas Ms. Brown also finds time to volunteer as judge on behalf of the AACA for high school and collegiate curriculum programs, and whereas it is fitting and proper that the Metropolitan Council recognize Ms. Sandra K. Brown for her many years of unconditional support and service to the AACA and for furthering their mission to enhance the awareness of the cultural and historical background of people of African descent. <laughs> now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of Metropolitan Government in Nashville and Davidson County Section one, the Metropolitan Council hereby goes on record as recognizing and honoring Sandra K. Brown for her service to the African American Culture Alliance and to the city of Nashville. The Metropolitan Council office is directed to prepare a copy of this resolution to be, be presented to Sandra K. Brown. This resolution shall take effect from and after its adoption. The welfare of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville, Davidson County uh, requiring it. Introduced by Edward Kendall, Karen Johnson, Sharon Hurt, Erica Gilmore, Brenda Haywood, Jacobia Dahl, Tanaka Virtue, Antoinette Lee, and all the other council people that you see up here uh, also. So their names are not on here, but they are just as important. While I'm standing here, though, I want to, we've got, we've also got a, a person with us, a fellow by the name of Kwame Lillard, Kwame Leo Lillard, that some of you know him as Leo, but he was a member of this council, and he does a phenomenal job with the African Street Festival. I don't know how he does it there. There, there are thousands of people at that festival. He invites me every year to embarrass me, but that's okay. Come on, Kwame. I, I think the most incredible attribute Ms. Sandra Brown has is she puts up with me almost every day for the last <laughs> yeah. 15 years. And I'm a wonderful person to get along with, aren't I? Aren't I? Yeah, she has no problem doing that. I'm, I'm not stubborn. I listen. I'm on time for everything. Uh, I never forget what it's supposed to be or say. So Ms. Brown deserves almost like a, a medal of honor to, to stay with this man called Kwame Little. Thank you, Ms. Brown. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to everybody, especially Karen Johnson, for um, proposing this. I always try, whenever I'm um, tasked with anything, I always do my best. Thank you. We're going to move to elections and confirmations. And we will start with the election of the next term council president pro tem for a one-year term that will end August 31st of 2019. Does anyone have nominations? Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to nominate Council Lady Berkeley Allen for the role. Thank you. Are there any other nominations? Council Lady Haywood. 
I would take great pleasure in nominating Council Lady Jacobia Dowell. Thank you. Council Lady Allen, would you wish to speak? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to have served in this role for several months, and uh, I feel like I've kind of begun to get the hang of it. Would like to continue to serve the council. Um, thank you for the opportunity to do the marathon last uh, last meeting. Um, it has been an honor to to sit in your seat when you needed a break, and I would um, be honored to serve the council in that role to uh, to finish my a full term up. So I would ask for for your vote for that. Thank you. Thank you. I will just say it was not my preference to be sick last week, but I'm sure glad I had had you there to do it. Uh, Council Lady Dow. Thank you. I just want to thank everyone for nominating me. Um, I've had the wonderful pleasure of serving on our council for the uh, last seven years. And as I've served, I always thought one of the things I wanted to do my last term is to serve as pro tem. And uh, uh, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to be nominated and to be considered for this role. I've served the last few years on our rules committee, and um, this term I have not served in a leadership role waiting for this opportunity to serve. So I was hoping to close out my council term as pro tem, but maybe I'll continue to serve in some other capacity. But I ask for your support and vote uh, to allow me to have the opportunity to serve and represent us this last year. And thank you so much. Thank you. Madam Clerk, would you please open the machines? You will see each candidate's name on the screen in front of you. Madam Clerk, you can close the machines. Tally the vote. <coughs> Oops, sorry. Thought I had it hit. There you go. 23 votes for Berkeley Allen. 15 votes for Jacoby Adele. Congratulations, Council Member Allen. I am now going to call on Councilman Elrod. Thank you, Madam President. With the election of the pro tem now complete, and as requested by the Council's Executive Committee, which uh, met uh, a couple weeks ago, I believe, I would now move to suspend the rules, specifically rules two and four, to allow for two things. One, a one month postponement of the appointment of committee chairs and members so that those appointments may be made by the soon to be elected vice mayor. Early voting going on now as is otherwise customary, and to postpone the election of a deputy pro tem until such time as it becomes necessary. Thank you, ma'am. Is there any objection to a suspension of the rules? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Councilman Elrod. Okay, let's continue with elections and confirmations. Council Lady Haywood. Thank you, Vice Mayor. At this time, we have a report from the Rules Confirmation and Public Elections Committee. And uh, we interviewed individuals for the airport authority. And we took a look at Amanda Farmworth for the reappointment for a term expiring June the 4th of 2022. We voted eight to zero, and I move for confirmation. You've heard the motion for confirmation of Ms. Amanda Farnsworth to the Airport Authority. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Council Lady Haywood. Next for the uh, Airport Authority, we have the appointment of Ms. Nancy Sullivan for a term expiring April the 6th of 2022. We voted eight in favor of and zero against, and I move for approval or confirmation. Thank you. You've heard the motion for confirmation of Ms. Nancy Sullivan to the Airport Authority. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Next, we have the Electric Power Board 
the reappointment of Mr. Robert McKay for a term expiring July the 1st of 2023. We voted eight in favor of and zero against, and I move for confirmation. Thank you. You've heard the motion for confirmation of Mr. Robert McCabe to the Electric Power Board. Councilman Elrod. Please mark me as abstaining, please. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Council Lady Haywood. Next, we have the Historical Commission. We have the reappointment of Mr. F. Clay Bailey III for a term expiring August the 1st of 2022. We voted six in favor of and zero against, and I move for confirmation. You've heard the motion for confirmation of Mr. Clay Bailey to the Historical Commission. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. Council Lady Haywood. Next, we have the appointment of Mr. Christopher Cotton for a term expiring August the 10th of 2022. We voted six in favor of and zero against for the Historical Commission, and I move for confirmation. Thank you. You've heard the motion for confirmation of Mr. Christopher Cotton to the Historical Commission. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. Next, again, for the Historical Commission, we have the appointment of Ms. Michelle Hall for a term expiring August the 10th of 2022. We voted six in favor of and zero against, and I move for confirmation. Thank you. You've heard the motion for confirmation of Ms. Michelle Hall to the Historical Commission. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. Council Lady Haywood. For the same commission, we have the reappointment of Mr. James Hoopler for a term expiring August the 10th of 2022. We voted six in favor of and zero against, and I move for confirmation. Thank you. You've heard the motion for confirmation of Mr. James Hubler to the Historical Commission. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. Last but certainly not least for the Historical Commission, we have the reappointment of Ms. Linda Wynn for a term expiring August the 10th of 2022. We voted six in favor of and zero against, and I move for confirmation. Thank you. You've heard the motion for confirmation of Ms. Linda Wynn to the Historical Commission. All in favor? Mo opposed? Motion passes. Council Lady Haywood. Next, we have the Human Relations Commission, the reappointment of Dr. Aaron Pryor for a term expiring April the 18th of 2021. We voted eight in favor of and zero against, and I move for confirmation. Thank you. You've heard the motion for confirmation of Dr. Aaron Pryor to the Human Relations Commission. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. Next, we have the Sports Authority. We have the appointment of Mr. John Glassmeyer, for a term expiring February the 17th of 2022, Mr. Glassmeyer will fill the unexpired term of Ms. Lisa Howe. We voted seven in favor of and zero against, and I move for confirmation. Thank you. You've heard the motion for confirmation of Mr. John Glassmeyer to the Sports Authority. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. If you would, please stand as I call your name. For the Airport Authority, Ms. Amanda Farnsworth and Ms. Nancy Sullivan. For the Electric Power Board, Mr. Robert McCabe. For the Historical Commission, Mr. F. Clay Bailey, Mr. Christopher Cotton, Ms. Michelle Hall, Mr. James Hubler, Ms. Linda Wynn. For the Human Relations Commission, Dr. Aaron Pryor. And for the Sports Authority, Mr. John Glassmeyer. On behalf of the entire Metro Council and the City of Nashville and Davidson County, we thank you for your willingness to serve and to volunteer your time and expertise. Thank you. For sure. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Wonderful meeting you. We are now going to move to the public comment period. This time is dedicated to allow members of the public who have registered in advance to speak to the council upon matters that are related to Nashville and Davidson County Municipality. 
I will call your name. If you know your order, go ahead and line up at the lectern. First will be Jane Borum, who hails from Councilman Sledge's district. Ms. Borum. Good evening. I'm the Reverend Jane Borum of Christ Church Cathedral and NOAA. I'm here to remind Nashville City Council and Mayor Briley of the March 2017 Council Resolution to, quote, immediate purchase, unquote, of enough body and dash cameras to cover the Metro Police Department's flex teams, which span Nashville's eight police precincts where crime is highest. This includes the North Nashville neighborhood where Daniel Hambrick was shot July 26. Police Chief Steve Anderson said in a YouTube video with then Mayor Barry, 316-17, that he could possibly equip the entire force within a year. The 2017 resolution called for deployment of 168 cameras by June 30, 2017. That was 14 months ago. So where are the body and dash cameras? What is the rollout plan update? When will the cameras be installed and help document police activity? Nashville deserves to know. Council needs to follow up. Mayor Briley, please inform Nashville citizens of a timeline. Thank you. Thank you. Vonda McDaniel, who hails from Councilman Hall's District Number 1. Thank you. Um, I first want to say that I appreciate this time that you all have set aside for citizens of Nashville to speak. Um, my name is Vonda McDaniel and I represent the Nashville Central Labor Council, which is um, one of the members of Stand Up Nashville. Um, as you all know, in 2015, the poverty rate in Nashville was around 16.9. That's 111,000 230 people living in poverty. With this MLS stadium, we have an opportunity to change the way we do development. We have an opportunity to raise the floor in terms of wages in Nashville. This is nothing new. These standards have been set in Austin, Miami, Los Angeles, and Chicago. Having a healthy and robust workforce has an impact on our community that I believe is positive and goes beyond just writing paychecks. It helps us to maintain a quality workforce, have lower turnover, reduce training costs, and it's just about what we value in the city. This community benefits agreement is an opportunity it's an opportunity to change how we do development in Nashville. I appreciate the, the support that I've heard and, and I hope that um, as we move forward in discussing this, that we will continue to expect that wages is an important component of anything that we do. And as I said at the beginning, I wanna thank uh, brother Freddie O'Connell for uh, inviting everyone to the Labor Day picnic um, the Central Labor Council doesn't just represent the interest of its members, but all workers in Nashville, and we want to do better. Thanks. Thank you. Next up would be Alfredo Pena. And you are from District 14, Councilman Roten's district. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Alfredo Pena. I am a, I am a member of the Laborers Local 386. I am also a member of Stand Up Nashville. I am here tonight to say that I support a community benefits agreement on the MLS stadium. I have been working around the Nashville construction area for the past three years, helping workers organize around wage theft and unsafe working conditions. As many of us know, 16 workers have died in Nashville in the past two years and in, in the several years that passed while working on many of these construction job sites around town. Two nights ago, we had a worker who fell in the hole but thank God he's alive and he, went, he was able to go back to his loved ones. As an OSHA certified trainer, it bothered me a lot that to hear of all these deaths happening 
So together with a lot of my coworkers, we helped cause a lot of publicity around 16 deaths that happened at these construction job sites. And we were able to prevent more workers from dying at these job sites by providing them free OSHA 10 trainings for them in their native language. We also like to educate workers about the rights that they have under the FLSA, which is the Fair Labor Standards Act, so that they can demand their stolen wages from big or small companies that are cheating them from their salaries and their earnings that, are, that their families are entitled for. These forms of wage theft can be seen as misclassification as workers, as subcontractors, and not employees, and they also don't get the overtime pay that they deserve. <clears throat> These, these uh, examples, we had just seen them not too long ago in summer, over 130-plus workers stepped forward claiming that they had been victims of wage theft from a major project just down the street from us at the JW Marriott, where the GC is Skanska. The stadium is the exact kind of project where workers would, be mo would most likely be brought in by bad actor temp agencies like Staff Zones, who is deemed as public nuisance. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you. And next would be John Feldhacker from my district, 22. Welcome. I am the pastor at Edge Hill United Methodist Church, a church that will always be known as Bill Barnes Church. Um, it was the first church founded as an intentionally integrated congregation in Nashville. It was during the Civil Rights Movement. Under Bill's leadership, Edge Hill was not only integrated, but it accepted the risk to open up the congregants' lives to share with our African-American brothers and sisters in the neighborhood, many whose families had been living in the Edge Hill neighborhood since before the Civil War. Wonderful things can happen when you risk sharing your life with people who are different than you are. For example, the imbalance in power, privilege, and opportunity becomes painfully obvious. One issue that was very close to Bill Barnes' heart and remains close to the congregation's heart to this very day is the painful shortage of affordable housing in Nashville. We need so much more than any current plan or vision will allow for. In the time that I've been at Edge Hill, I've witnessed aggressive economic and population growth, growth and it's given me an opportunity to get, and get to know and love many of the families who live under the burden of concentrated poverty within our neighborhood. During this time, their lives have actually gotten worse as Nashville has boomed. These years has allowed me to look for a place to live for myself in this neighborhood where I serve, only that learned that on a pastor's salary, I can't even afford or begin to afford to live in the Edge Hill neighborhood, in the neighborhood I've grown to love. I've seen countless perfectly functional and well-built and affordable homes knocked down to make room for beautiful, massive, and very expensive homes. We can't sustain a city like Nashville when school teachers, municipal workers, hospitality employees, and yes, even pastors can't afford to live in a city. We'd love to see Major League Soccer, but not without a solid community benefits agreement with affordable housing components tied to that. Thank you. Thank you. Also hailing from Bellevue, District 35, Paulette Coleman. Welcome. Good evening and thank you. I chaired the Affordable Housing Task Force for NOAA. For the past four years, we have been studying, we have been bringing forth plans, we have been requesting plans for affordable housing. Unfortunately, there have been some feeble efforts, but nothing robust and dynamic. If a fraction of the time, energy, and resources will have been spent on affordable housing, as have been spent on plans for soccer, plans for Music City, and many of the other plans for cultural amenities and recreational amenities had been spent on affordable housing, we would be much farther along in, in, in answering and responding to the problem. I am here because I support growth, but I insist, and I support development, but I insist that it must be equitable, it must be fair, it must be just, and it must be inclusive. 
one of the ways of accomplishing that is to ensure that we incorporate community benefits agreement as a matter of routine in our development efforts. The choice is yours, ultimately. And the choice is, if we don't have some of the cultural amenities, what will it do to our city? And I think you can answer that a variety of ways. But if we don't have affordable housing, it will be disruptive and the consequences will be felt long term. The critical need is for affordable housing for families. And there are plans afoot. There's been some resistance and pushback from the supporters of the soccer field. But we must come together to make this city a city for all of us that includes community b benefits agreements in all of our development efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kay Bowers from Russ Police District 25. Thank you. First of all, um, thank you for your commitment to the work of this body <clears throat> and the time that you invest to do your job in a thoughtful and deliberative manner, and it doesn't go unnoticed. So I thought that was important to start with. I'm here to speak in favor of a strong community benefit agreement, particularly the affordable housing component tied to the development affiliated with the National Soccer Stadium. These are important data points I'd like to share with you. As of June of 2018, in Davidson County, there were 390,580 employed in our labor force. The latest data show that the median earnings, that means the middle, for our labor force is $31,899. So out of these 390,000 580 people in our workforce, 195,790 of them earn $31,899 or less. What that amounts to is about $2,600 a month before taxes and withholding. At the current rent levels in Nashville, Families at this income level are severely cost burdened, spending 50% and more of their gross rent or their gross income for rent. We all know the housing crisis we find ourselves in, where more than 46% of our renters are cost burdened and people are being pushed out and our workers are being pushed out. Under the current proposal, somewhere between seven and 900 housing units I'll speak fast, are to be built on publicly owned land under a land lease. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. There are examples across the United States of successful projects. I'll be happy to share. Thank Thanks. you so much. We appreciate your time. Donald Burks, who hails from Councilman Roten's District 14. Please come on down. Hello, everybody. What time is my, when does the clock start, right now? Okay, I sent this message and I've had to be, I had to cut it down and edit it down quite a bit because I sent it to the council, the police chief, blah, blah, blah. I get, I got not one acknowledgement that I sent it out, so I figured the best way is to come here and present it to you folks in person, okay? So, I'll just read it to you. Dear Mayor Riley and Metro Council members, please tell me what criteria you use to defend nearly $2 million cut from the police budget when more crime is being reported here than ever before? Makes no sense to me, particularly when 40% of our money goes to education, part of which funds high salaries for too many administrators. Because the education department is top heavy, that's where you should focus your cuts to free up money our Metro PD needs and deserves more than ever. <clears throat> As you well know, People everywhere are scared to death because crime in the streets against persons has expanded beyond the historical borders of blighted neighborhoods. A major newspaper reported a 27% murder rate increase nationally. Even our tours driven uh, downtown area has seen a rise in major crimes alongside districts that had been considered safe by its residents. 
National, Nashville made national news a couple of days ago uh, featuring the double murder at the Cobra nightclub in East Nashville, not to mention other similar crimes um, recently. Our son and daughter live in uh, Inglewood, a relatively stable no neighborhood where many elderly folks have resided for decades. In the past month, however, there have been two daytime robberies, one of which was perpetrated against a 90-year-old lady who was thrown to the ground and injured. Made worse by the frequency and volume of crime is the viciousness of it all. Clearly, crime in Davidson County is out of control and growing worse. Because public safety seems not to be a top right priority for our metro government, I'm wondering if perhaps there might be an anti-police sentiment residing within the Metro Council. Have politics trump principle? Hope I'm wrong, but that's the way it appears to me. I've got more to say, but apparently I'm cut off. Thank you for your time. And lastly, we have Rebecca West, who hails from Jeff Syracuse District 15. Hi, uh, my name is Rebecca West, and I am a Nashville native. Um, I'm here partly on behalf of Let's Play, um, which is an organization we use soccer uh, to teach English to refugee and immigrant students here in Nashville. And um, it has been an organization that has evolved over time, partly in response to how much our county has changed in the past decade. Um, much of the growth has come as um, internationals have moved here from all over the world. Uh, and that's something that I'm sure you all are aware of, but the rate of growth for um, people who are from other countries is, is much faster than the rate of growth in Nashville from people who are from here, uh, from the United States originally. Um, so I want to encourage uh, encourage you all to continue moving forward with the uh, with the MLS proposal. However, uh, I agree with the what has been said before, and so I actually wanted to give the rest of my time over for you to finish your comment, if that's all right. Thank you. Under the current proposal, it's my understanding that somewhere between seven and 900 residential units are to be built on publicly owned land under the land lease. There are countless successful examples across the country of mixed income housing projects that set aside at minimum 25 to 30% for long-term affordable housing with a significant amount of public assets involved in this project, expecting to benefit of 25% of the housing units to be set aside for long-term affordable housing, hopefully for the workers that will be working there, is more than reasonable. The numbers can work, it can be done, and our times call for transformative leaders willing to make transformative policy. Thank you. Thank you. We are now going to move into the consent agenda. I'll read the items that are on the consent agenda. RS 2018-1338, RS 2018-1362, Does anything need to be pulled off? the consent agenda in addition to these items that are on. Okay, seeing none, I'll go ahead and I'll read the captions. Resolution RS 2018-1338, sponsors Shulman, Roberts, and Withers, approves a contract between Metro and N4 Inc. to provide maintenance and support of workforce time and attendance software for Metro Nashville Police Department. RS 2018-1362, Sponsors Hager, Vercher, and Elrod. Authorizes the Director of Public Property to purchase two flood prone properties located at 119 and 121 Commerce Street for Metro Water Services. RS 2018 1363. Councilmember Vercher sponsors approves a grant from the Davidson County Mental Health and Veterans Court Assistance Foundation to the Davidson County General Sessions Court Division II to supplement employee salaries and assist in providing direct assistance to Veterans Treatment Court participants. RS 2018-1364 sponsors Vercher, Hurt, and Gilmore appropriates $40,000 from the Youth Violence Grassroots Initiative to various nonprofit organizations selected to receive related grants. 
Resolution RS 2018-1365, sponsored by Vercher, authorizes the Department of Law to compromise and settle the personal injury claim of Adolfo Martinez against Metro in the amount of $7,250. RS 2018-1366, sponsored Council Lady Vercher, authorizes the Department of Law to compromise and settle the claim of Melissa Harris against the Metro in amount of $200,000. RS 2018-1370 sponsors Bircher and Elrod, authorizes the Department of Water and Sewer Services to enter into a contract with the Tennessee Department of Transportation for access to the TDOT GNSS reference network. RS 2018-1371 sponsors Bircher and Elrod, approves the Keep America Beautiful Lowe's Community Partner Grant with the Metro Public Works Department to plant trees and daffodils at public schools during hands-on Nashville Day. RS 2018-1374 sponsored Glover requests the Department of Finance to investigate the appropriation of an amount not to exceed $20,000 to Box 55 Association for reimbursement of fuel costs for volunteers. RS 2018-1375, sponsor Van Rees, honors Janet Jernigan upon the occasion of her retirement from 50 forward. RS 2018-1376, sponsors Murphy, recognizes Marcus Panic upon earning the Eagle Scout Award. I will call for committee reports. Council Lady Bircher. Thank you, Madam President. Um, for RS 2018, 1362, 1363, 64, 65, 66, budget and finance recommended approval, 10 4, 0 against. And for RS 2018, 1370, and 71, budget and finance recommended approval, 10 4, 0 against. And RS 2018, 1374, budget and finance recommended approval, 11 4, 0 against. Thank you. Councilman Withers. Thank you. The Personnel, Public Information, Human Relations and Housing Committee met this afternoon and considered Resolution RS 2018-1338 and recommended approval for in favor, zero against. Thank you. Councilman Bedney. Um, is 1362 one of the ones you I didn't hear you say that? 1362. Yes. Yeah, okay, that one was uh, recommended for approval by planning, 10 4 0 against. Thank you. Councilman Elrod. Public Works Record and Approval Resolutions 1362, 70, and 71, 6 in favor, 0 against. Thank you. Council Lady Haywood. Twenty sixteen thirteen seventy five. Okay, uh, yes, we entertain 1375 and resolution 2018-1376, and we approved it eight to zero uh, for confirmation, approval. And would you like to move the consent agenda? Yes, I would. Now that all of the reports are in, I would like to move the entire consent agenda. Thank you, Council Lady Murphy. Due to my employment with the Veterans Treatment Court, I would like foundation, I'd like to be marked as recused on RS 2018, 1363. Thank you. All in favor of the consent agenda? Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, now we're gonna go through the resolutions that are not on the consent agenda. We will start with RS 2018, 1314. This is for charter revision. And here's how we're gonna handle these, just to make it easy. We're gonna take one at a time. I'll call the first one, and Mr. Jameson will read a brief description. He will explain it, then I will call on Council Member Rosenberg to move his amendment, and then we'll take each amendment to the Charter Amendment, and then once we get through all of the Charter Amendment opportunities, and once we have voted on each piece, we will then go back and we will vote on the resolution as amended. Mr. Jameson. 
Thank you. There are six separate charter amendments. We will refer to the charter amendments as such and then amendments to the charter amendments as such. Charter Amendment A was considered at the August 7th Council meeting and passed with a late file amendment, so that is already um, uh, before you. That brings you to a Charter Amendment number B, as in boy. There was an amendment to Charter Amendment B, uh, which was, it is still on page two of your materials. That was adopted by this body. There is a second amendment. E on page 10 of your materials by Councilman Rosenberg uh, providing essentially a holiday scheduling uh, exception. Councilman Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. I'm thrilled that so many people came out tonight to hear us discuss these charter amendments. Um, so uh, charter amendment B, uh, this was the amendment regarding special elections as amended at our previous meeting. Uh, first, I'd like to present another amendment to this amendment that comes as a result of an issue that occurred at the Davidson County Election Commission meeting 11 days ago that we're affectionately calling the Rosh Hashanah fix. Um, Section 1503 of the Charter calls for runoff elections after special elections uh, to take place five weeks following the, uh, the general election. Uh, in 2007, that coincided with Rosh Hashanah uh, led to a federal lawsuit, and Representative Mike Turner and Senator Joe Haynes eventually passed a uh, state law, a uh, bill at the legislature, to allow them to move it off of Rosh Hashanah. Uh, it, it, it opened the period up to 35 to 45 days, but was specifically intended um, and stated on the floor of the House to be about allowing uh, folks to vote on Rosh Hashanah, who, or folks to, who could not vote on Rosh Hashanah to vote um, this has created a little bit of an inconsistency and confusion uh, since the charter provision just says five weeks. So what this amendment to Amendment B would do is state explicitly that in the event of a major holiday or another major event occurring five weeks after a special election, the election commission would be explicitly authorized to move the runoff election up to two days in either direction which is exactly what they did in 2007. I'm happy to answer any questions on this amendment to be and move adoption. So we have a motion to adopt amendment E to charter amendment B. No one wishing to speak, we have a second. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes, they should all be this easy. Amen. Mr. Jameson. That brings you now to amendment, Charter Amendment B with the amendment that was just adopted. So what we're voting on is the Charter Amendment as amended. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, you Madam in? President. Um, so to reiterate where we left off uh, just after midnight last meeting, we voted to amend the provision regarding district council members so that instead of district seats sitting vacant for up to eight months, that would change to uh, 12 months, that would change to eight months. And then this amendment also substantially cleans up the language in section 1503, whose current ambiguity ended up in the Tennessee Supreme Court, and also applies the amendment regarding major holidays we just discussed. Uh, it received the unanimous approval of the Charter Review Committee, and I move approval. Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes, Mr. Jameson. That brings you to Charter Amendment C, as in Charlie. This would essentially provide uh, instant runoff uh, elections in certain instances and eliminate runoffs for vice mayor and district council members. Uh, this, uh, at the Charter Commission, was met with a motion to not approve 5 and 0. There are two amendments to Charter Amendment C. Amendment C on page four of your packet, and Amendment D on page seven. Councilman Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to move Amendment D uh, to amend, oh God. Amendment D to Charter Amendment C, please. Uh, that is just a cleanup amendment. Is there a second? No Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? No Opposed? Motion passes, Mr. Rosenberg. Okay, so Amendment C, um, and 
there's a handout on everyone's desk that just gives a quick summary of all of these if I start getting twisted around. Um, so this amendment eliminates the hypothetical runoff election for vice mayor and district council member. Uh, instead, voters would rank candidates in order of preference. preference. So under the current charter provision, in the event that no candidate in a special election for vice mayor or district council member receives a majority, a runoff election is held, again, hypothetically. Under this amendment, in a special election for mayor or district council member, only special elections for those two offices, voters would instead rank candidates in order of preference. Uh, this is known as instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting. And in the event that no candidate in such an election receives a majority, the lowest ranking candidates' votes are reallocated to remaining candidates based on the eliminated candidates' voters' second choice. Uh, this method offers several advantages. Cost, a countywide vice mayoral runoff like the one we're having next, this month can cost up to, uh, next month can cost up to $750,000. Convenience, voters will be asked to cast a, ba a vote for the fourth time this year, or if you live in District 1 for the sixth time this year. Clarity, with the primary election behind us and candidates for senator, governor, and state legislature in place, most eyes have turned to the November election. An intervening election in September, not long before early voting for the general, will hurt mobilization efforts. Four, congeniality. Many campaigns are dominated not by substance, but by personal attacks. It's the norm at the federal level, it's pervasive at the state level, and we see it increasing at the local level. Under this method, candidate A cannot risk alienating candidate B supporters because A might need those voters to rank candidate A second. Crowd, turnout almost always plummets out in a runoff, giving fewer voters a choice. And concurrence, in a runoff, you don't always end up with the two most widely supported candidates due to vote splitting. This method solves that. It's used at the local and state level nationwide with great success. And with the improvements to cost, convenience, clarity, and congeniality, we should implement it at the, on, at, on this limited basis as well. I um, should also note at the election commission meeting a couple weeks ago when they were discussing when to have the vice mayoral runoff, they brought up a lot of concerns that I had not previously considered with our current runoff system. They've had a lot of polling places that are refusing to continue to be polling places because of all the elections they've had to host. They're having to set up early voting really quickly, and if the sites aren't available, there isn't time to set up networks at a new early voting site, so that area of the county would go unserved. Poll workers are often not available in this uh, frequency, and also machine memory cards have to be held for a certain length of time after certification of the previous election, which is causing fast turnaround being necessary to get a runoff set up. This would solve that just in these limited scenarios uh, where we have a special election for district council member or vice mayor, uh, vice mayor and I move approval. Councilman Hastings. This actually sounds um, like an answer to some things, but me being who I am and also a representative of the community and I'm not speaking against this I just think that the, uh, we need more clarity because it's kind of confusing to even myself with with listening and hearing this um, I, I don't I don't necessarily understand about the the rank ranking and standing up and going for, forth with the first and the second person and all, all of those things. It's very new and I think the community is probably gonna be the same way of, of you know, being confused over this. I think what we're gonna have to do is to have more tutorials or whatever for the community as we go along, especially if we adopt this. You know, I'm not saying that a new way is bad and I'm not saying that at all, but what I am saying that this is, this is confusing for the average voter, I know I'm a voter myself. This is kind of confusing for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I, first of all, I want to thank the sponsor and the committee for working on these so diligently because I, I, I really, my hat's off to them because I know this stuff is not easy. I had two quick questions. Um, one, just a clarifying question. I just want to make sure based on the information we've got in front of us, this would replace runoffs with IRV just for special elections. Is that correct? I just want to be 
super, super clear. Mr. Okay. Jameson. Correct. Perfect. Okay. So then my second question is both, I think, for Mr. Jameson and the sponsor. Um, my familiarity with IRV goes is from two places. One, my best friend lives in Maine, and they just implemented that, I think, for basically all their elections. I think because they wanted to make sure they never got their current governor again. Um, but the <laughs> second piece was Memphis. I think Memphis's council had looked at this, and I think there's been some legal questions to that. And quite frankly, I don't know where that stands. So I'm trying to figure out that, and I'd love input. Thanks. There was a administrative law judge hearing, uh, to my knowledge, uh, that decision has not yet been rendered. There is also, uh, I believe, a ballot initiative uh, at the city of uh, Memphis uh, set later this year, uh, which would rescind the instant runoff voting provision. Councilman Rosenberg may have more up-to-date information. Councilman Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Memphis, uh, some of the uh, entrenched elected officials didn't like the idea anymore. Uh, feeling it wouldn't be to their electoral uh, advantage anymore, so they have sought to take that off. Um, I would also note that this amendment includes an, a, a, uh, an escape hatch or a savings clause, wherein if at some point uh, it's found to, or, or this becomes unlawful under state law, it would revert to the runoff elections, so it would not put us in a, in a damaging place where we don't have a provision to handle this. Thank you. Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I, I think I'd just like to um, acknowledge a couple of concerns that have been raised. I know uh, to Councilman Hastings is uh, concern. I, I guess I'd say, you know, this is a thing where we, there, th this is not something that uh, Councilman Rosenberg just invented. This is a system that is in place in multiple jurisdictions, including uh, local and state jurisdictions around the country. There are plenty of uh, tutorials available for this. I mean, it's like uh, when we have updated to uh, new election uh, technology in the past, right? Uh, people, when the moment that we move from uh, paper ballots to electronic voting was a significant uh, and profound change for many Nashville voters. This, I think, would actually be a uh, relatively modest change given where we are in terms of uh, interfaces of election equipment. I think the biggest thing to consider here is while this is an unusual year for Natra Nashville, it is not uh, that uncommon to have uh, seats become vacated either through uh, death, illness, choice of candidate, resignation, et cetera, uh, in local jurisdictions. And I think uh, if we just look simply at the cost considerations, much less the electoral uh, efficiencies and insights that are also advantages of, of instant run-up voting, this amendment deserves our support. Uh, and the taxpayers, uh, I think, of, of Nashville and Davidson County would do well to be able to consider it fully and fairly. Thank you. Thank you. Council Lady Murphy. I have some concerns about instant um, runoff voting in general, but maybe, uh, Mr. Jamison, you can speak to, I'm clearly not an attorney, but I did take a little class in law school, or not in law school, in, in, in college about Baker v. Carr and one man, one vote, and what what is what some red flags that I'm hearing here tonight is that we're gonna treat voting one way in one election, but a different way in a different election for the same seat. Whereas right now, I understand that we have, we've all been through this. A lot of us were, re were elected through runoff um, elections or special elections. And while we do have other offices that represent us, such as at the state level that don't have runoffs, I, I have some concerns about treating the election for, for this seat or for that seat or for any of these seats differently in different elections. Um, waiting the votes, not waiting the votes. I, I just, is is this done in other places where it's the same seat, the same office, but elected in different ways? Right, and we do. Uh, and even in Davidson County, we elect at-larges on a different basis than district council members because of the makeup of the office. But um, the State Election Commission Director Mark Goins has expressed concerns in a letter from 2017. It is not an appellate decision that is not governing authority, but he does express uh, concern that instant runoff voting would not be in compliance with two state statutes, um, one of which he construes as prohibiting an additional ballot count after an election. 
Now, I think proponents of instant runoff voting would note that it's not an, it's not an additional ballot count. The, the point of it is to have an instant runoff determination immediately to save money. But nevertheless, he has expressed that opinion. We don't have the ALJ opinion from Memphis yet. That would probably be the governing authority, the most available we have. I think the ultimate solution is that within this amendment itself, there's a specific line that says if it's determined that instant runoff voting becomes repugnant to state law, essentially we would revert back to what the, the code section provides today. So that's, that's the safety mechanism that I think makes this safe in the interim. I think at the end of the day, I'm just, I'm not comfortable having two types of elections for, for the same seat. Obviously the at-large um, offices and desks up there are different because they are, they are countywide and that's a little slightly different office. But when it comes to a, a district council member and things like that, I, I have some serious concerns about um, whether it's fair to elect them differently, um, say in August and then the following six months later or something like that. So I'm going to vote against this. I, I appreciate the time that has been put into it by, by the sponsors, um, but I, I'm just not comfortable with treating votes differently that way. Thank you. Councilman Pridemore. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Uh, Mr. Jameson, pardon me for being less attentive than I should be, but what did you say the, the committee report was? The, the personnel committee report was the on charter that. commission uh, met on this before the August seventh uh, council meeting, and their recommendation was to not approve uh, mm -hmm. five uh, five and zero. Oh. Thank you, sir. Councilman Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the charter review committee, charter revision committee, voted unanimously in favor of it. So for what it's worth, um, I would note a, a couple things. First of all, uh, there, most southern states use instant runoff voting for all elections for military and overseas ballots um, with great success. It's also used throughout the country very successfully uh, in, in cities and as, uh, as uh, mentioned earlier in the state of Maine where they used it to great success this year. Uh, uh, second thing is that we are not saying by voting for this, that this is what we're gonna do. We're giving the voters the opportunity to make the choice. We're putting it on the ballot for the people of Nashville to decide, which I know people are in favor of in a lot of situations. Uh, so pending any further discussion, I renew my motion. Sorry, Council Lady Gilmore. Um, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. I just wanted, uh, Mr. Jameson could explain C again and, in, and explain it, I guess, in relationship to B, because I think the two are connected, even though they're, we've separated them out. And, and, and I'll, I'll just kind of preface my question to give a context. Okay, so if we do rank uh, voting, which is one, two, three, say there are four people that are running, you say, this is my first choice, this is my second choice, this is my third choice. However, if we reduce it from 12 months to eight months without a representation, we're supposed to have an election, I don't know that that gives, just from running a race myself, it gives proper opportunity to get booted up. So if you go straight to this, the person who probably has the most um, money and whatever at that time that cannot get the, I, I, I don't know, I don't know about the, but if you could just explain that more, and I guess I'm saying that in that context, to re reduce it from 12 months to eight months, I don't know what that does in terms of equality and equity. If you could just speak to that. Sure, so Charter Amendment B was designed to uh, essentially clarify the duration of a vacancy that triggers a special election. So if that's adopted, then you've got a vacancy in the mayor's office of 12 months, if, the, if something happens to the mayor and there's a vacancy the last 12 months, special election is triggered. Vice mayor, 24 months. District council member, six months. And at large, there's just not a special election to be scheduled. That's Charter Amendment B. Charter Amendment C is the instant runoff provision that exists for vi vice mayor and at large and eliminates runoffs in those instances as a cost-saving mechanism. Just one reminder, we're still on a housekeeping amendment, D, to Charter Amendment C. And that's, that's what's on the floor. You might 
you may want to vote on that and then move to Charter Amendment C as a whole. Okay, but I guess just one more um, follow-up question. It seems like we're re reducing it from 12 months, though, to eight months. Is that not, or B, even though we're looking at C? We're right. reducing so, the amount of so time. We're saying it cannot be, it has to be less, if it's less than 12 months now, we can have a, a race. So it's, it's a different period for different offices. So at the previous August 7th meeting before deferral, there was an amendment that was passed from Council Lady Johnson that said the, the vacancy duration for the district council member office originally proposed as being six months triggering a special election now would be extended to eight months gotcha. to give that person a little more time. And that, that was approved. Okay, thank you. Council Lady Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. Okay, I want this broken down in simple terms. Uh, Attorney Jamison, if you are in your last year and you are term limited, us making this change, give me the scenario, okay? You have eight months left and a regular election comes up where you can pull papers in February. We all have gone through this. You pull papers in February and then that period of February, March, April, you have the deadline to submit in April. And then the election is set for August. Early voting starts in July. Okay, what will this do? Will it have a council person elected for two to three months while others are pulling papers to run for the regular election in August of that same year. Give me a scenario so I can understand this clearly, as well as other council members, because I think when you're talking, that's why I asked you all to look at this in committee and make a, make a um, edit to this particular amendment to take out this provision applying to someone in their last year of a term limited situation. This will work fine if you're a first term council member, but if you are a second term council member, how does that work? So under the a charter- Point of order, please. This, we're not on this amendment. That is correct. Well, but the question was asked by council lady at large uh, Erica Gilmore, and I just see a sense of, of swiftly moving this through because all of us is uh, worried about the soccer vote and everything else in here tonight. Everybody's stressed out about all the transit-oriented development, the district, and everything else. And so everybody's sitting here glossy-eyed because they don't even know what's going on. Council Lady Johnson. You have the opportunity to vote no and then discuss this. But nobody we, knows to discuss. vote no because th you all are flying through the Please items. Please permit me to finish. We're giving everybody the opportunity to speak. We're going to do it in order. If you would like to speak on the resolution as amended, once we get to that point, you're more than welcome to do that. And that as amended would require 27 votes. That's correct. And that particular one that you all just passed, which was B, which reduces it to eight months. There's no more discussion on that. It passed. Okay, see? So now we need 27 votes when this all comes in because we've already skated through it. Councilman Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. Um, on the back side of the handout on your desk, uh, the snapshot is a timeline of how we've rushed through this. Uh, it was filed on April 20th of 2018. We've had five charter revision committee Sorry, meetings, committee. three charter review commission meetings, and this is here on the floor for the sixth time tonight. So respectfully, I don't feel like we're rushing through it, and I appreciate the thorough discussion tonight. Uh, and I guess I'll renew my motion on the housekeeping amendment to Amendment C, please. We have one more speaker in the queue, Councilman O'Connell. Call a question. You were the last one, so we're going to call a question. Mr. Jamison, would you please recap 
our amendment D to charter amendment C on instant runoff, please. Uh, amendment D to charter amendment C corrects some section numbering uh, housekeeping changes and clarifies uh, that runoff elections occur after uh, the special elections, um, subsequent to special elections. Okay, having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, we're gonna go to the machines. Madam Clerk, please open the machines. So for this piece, we are going to need 21 votes on the amendment to the charter amendment. Hang on a minute. Councilman O'Connell, you had a question. And just point of information, I want to make sure that people voting there knew that they were voting on the amendment to the amendment and not on the amendment itself. Correct. Correct. Okay. We are voting on the amendment. Once All we right. vote, alternatively, we'll explain that. But right now we are voting on the amendment to the charter amendment. Councilman Davis. Madam Clerk, you can close the machines. Tally the vote, please. Two in favor, four against, and one abstention. Hang on, my screen just hung up, y'all. Councilman Elrod. Is this on the amendment? Just the amendment? Let's see. Hang okay. Uh, Charter amendment. Councilman, hang on just a minute. I'm trying to fix the screen. Mr. Jameson, just clarify that we're on the Charter Amendment, please. Uh, Councilman Elrod is correct. We're now on Amendment C as amended. Does anybody have a question, Mr. Elrod? I was just going to rise in support of Amendment C. I think the uh, purpose of all of the amendments, or n not all of them, but m most of them that Councilman Rosenberg is putting forward is to get, um, to have people get representation in their local city government faster. Um, that's what Amendment B did. Uh, Amendment C will also do that. It'll eliminate a costly runoff um, that um, gives more, that prevents people from having representation on their Metro Council. So I am in support of it. It's um, something that uh, saves money and gets representation for people faster. I'm in favor of. Thank you. Councilman Rosenberg, would you like to move your charter amendment as amended? Yeah, yes, thank you, Madam President. I would, I would love to give the people the choice to vote on this and move amendment C as amendment amended. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor? Opposed? Go to the machines. Madam Clerk, if you'll open them. See if my screen will work this time. And this takes 27. Sorry. And it takes 27. It'll take 27 votes to pass this one. Madam Clerk, you can close the machines. Tally the vote, please. 25 in favor, 11 against, two abstentions. Okay. Okay, so C will not be included. We are now going to move to Charter Amendment D. Mr. Jameson. Charter Amendment D would simply revise the oath of office that currently provides uh, essentially allegiance to the constitutions of the state of Tennessee and the United States. This would add the Metropolitan Charter to the oath of office for both council members, vice mayor and mayor. Council Lady Blaylock. Move for approval. 
Councilman Bednay. Yeah, I just wanted to remind us all that we're just giving the people in Davidson County the opportunity to vote on these ideas. So we, we are just putting on the ballot for them to decide, and I think it makes sense to give them a chance to help us make these decisions. Uh, I think I, I'm in support of all this amendment because uh, it allows people to help us decide what type of an electoral process they want to have. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that. I mean, it's here, but just as a reminder. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Eddie Gilmore. Yes, I wanted to um, have Council Lady Blaylock to exp provide a, c a context for this amendment, please. Council Lady Blaylock. Basically, we don't have to take an oath saying that we're going to uphold the charter, and it's just what this does. Council Lady Gilmore. But it's saying that we're, t maybe I missed it. it said, I thought it said it was tying it to the United States. We're tying it to the state of Tennessee. Did I miss that part? We already say that now. Okay. We don't. For this for our charter okay thank you seeing no one else in the queue all in favor Aye. opposed motion passes we are now on charter amendment e mr jameson charter amendment e would revise the current term limits in effect for council members both at large and district council members which is currently two terms this would extend it to three terms the term limits for mayor and vice mayor would remain the same, too. Council Lady Blaylock. Thank you, and move for approval. Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Um, I, I, I totally understand the rationale behind this. I'd just like to present maybe a, a differing opinion on it. Um, I, I know we are at a time, I think, in the city and in the country where we're encouraging a lot of people to get involved in the political process and to run for office and um, to really kind of take on new responsibilities with our democracy that maybe they haven't considered before. Um, and I fear that this, while I know it's, it's well-intentioned and meant to sort of create a hopefully more efficient and informed government, um, I fear that it might send the indirect message that we're asking to shut people out of the process, um, especially uh, people who, like myself, who might be, you know, considering this as, you know, the, you know, they're younger or might say that I don't know how else to get involved if I want to be involved in politics in my city and that this is that opportunity. So I, I really do respect everything um, that's behind this, but I, I'm going to have to vote no on it because I believe that these term limits are the right limits. Um, and I think when we set those limits, we kind of create a bar that says, you know, this is the time frame that you potentially have to get things done or put forth your priorities within the council and then we prepare hopefully people in the uh, in our districts um, or around the county uh, to take on that responsibility next. So I appreciate the council's indulgence. Thank you. Councilman Pardue. Hang on. It's hang on. It's frozen. Nope. Murphy's Law, right? Time out, folks. we got to reboot the system. Right. We've got six separate amendments. We're going through roll number one. So the eight months pass. Right. So if at the end they don't understand it, that one will be included. Right. I think you can stand up and say, look, this is going to say eight months now. What happened? I just, this is. Uh, right. So what happened? I just, system. she just, that's just She'll get over it. No, but she might, anyway. It, so. pro, it failed. So what's your point? Um, anyway, what what it froze. So every time I went to push for somebody to speak, whether it was on their name or the list, okay. it wouldn't come up, and then I couldn't turn anybody off. So we refreshed it, it didn't work, so we were having to redo it. Okay. So what's what happened? She 
doesn't like the eight month duration in Amendment B. And so, what did this do? She was saying? a senator. She could have spoken up. Yeah. 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 That's what was called the voters. Now I'm on. Get up here and be a pro tem. <laughs> fix the IT. I can't fix it's it. part of the new pro tem duties. <laughs> So I'd like to remind the entire council that all of your microphones are hot. They are all on. System is down, everybody's mic is on. So bear with us just another minute. We may uh, proceed with the meeting and just be polite. Okay, we're on. We're ready to roll. Councilman Pardue. Can you hear me now? I sure can. My question is probably to Mr. Jameson. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when there, there weren't any term limits on the council. Who changed that? Did the council change it or was that changed by the voters? It was uh, 
I believe in 1990, early 1990s, there was, uh, during the Ross Perot presidential campaign and term limits were introduced as a sort of a local initiative as part of that campaign, and it was by charter amendment at that time. Shouldn't that be the way we change it back if that's what we want to do? And that's what, that's what this is. Okay, thank you. Council Mina Johnson. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Um, I have a question in this uh, amendment E. Uh, there's a reference, uh, I think the question is uh, Mr. Jameson. Sorry. I have a question uh, in regards to amendment uh, in this section, uh, section C and section D, which is uh, specifically uh, request uh, people of Davidson County uh, reduce uh, House of Representative term to three, and then uh, state uh, Senate term to two term. So uh, respectively, six years and eight years. Also, Section D uh, cites uh, Davidson County request Congress term to be three terms, and Senate term to be uh, two years. Respectfully, uh, that will limit six years and 12 years. Although amendment language is just a reference to uh, council term will be extended two times to three times. Could you please explain to me that C and D, how does it play into this amendment? Correct. So uh, um, sections C and D of the current charter 1.07 are in there today. Um, they are simply repeated here so you see the entire section. So this is not a change. C and D are exactly as they appear in the charter today. They were added by charter amendment back in the early 90s and again this requires the clerk's office every year and they dutifully issue this letter to essentially all the members of uh, relevant members of congress requesting the term limit pursuit the charter commission as opposed to the committee the commission that met before august 7th um, approved this amendment e but did make the recommendation that those two paragraphs be stricken Thank you for the clarification. Uh, just wanted to make it sure. So nothing changed, but this amendment will just give uh, Davidson County uh, citizen to vote for increase the uh, council term or keep it as is. Correct. Thank you. Uh, I understand uh, we do have tried, and I do appreciate institu institutional knowledge and experience. Uh, and also, I would like to give a chance to the citizens of Davidson County. Uh, for that reason, I'll be uh, supporting this amendment. Thank you. Councilman Glover. Hang on. There you go. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just food for thought. One of the problems that we have in this chamber is we gave up a lot of power, and when I say power, I'm talking about what we can actually effectively do here because we run concurrent with two terms just like the mayor's office does, and without um, trying to sound too rude, they know that. And one thing that we don't have that, we, uh, that I think is important is if you look back at the actual history, um, and if I, I, I don't know that my numbers are exactly right, but before there were term limits, the average council person stayed just uh, uh, right under 11 years. Because let's face it, you know, it's a tough job, and we, we all know that. But, you know, it's a choice that I think the voters uh, need to have the opportunity. The second thing it does for you is everybody knows the first little bit you're in here, it's kind of challenging to know what you do, who you do it with, and, and, and how to get things accomplished. Then when you get reelected, you're here and everybody knows, well, they're gone. And so it gives you the opportunity. And the other thing I think that is important to maybe consider is it also continues to hold you accountable to the voters. If you're term limited out, then, eh, you know. And so I think uh, the voters may say no, uh, but I, I think that we give them the opportunity to, and then we sit down and if you want to run again, you run. If you don't, you say two terms was plenty for me. But it doesn't, it does, or one term may have been enough, you know, just what, whatever the case may be. But, it, but what it does do is it does allow you to keep this body, I'm not talking about individuals, but it allows to keep this body a bit more powerful to where we are the true legislative branch and we're not just rubber stamping things. So that's my food for thought. I'll be supporting this because I think we give the voters the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Bednick. 
I can't believe I'm agreeing to cancel my glower. And, uh, <laughs> but think about it. If we do this, people will get a chance to re-elect Council Member Glover again. And so that's, that's a good thing, because we do need to have people with experience in the council. And uh, the mayor's office, with all due respect to the hardworking people in the mayor's office, they, they, have, they have more staff, more knowledge, more know-how, more ways to uh, do things than we do in the council. So experience is the way we have to be able to be a good counterweight, which is what the people of Nashville want us to do. And uh, so I think we should give people of Nashville an opportunity to decide again if they think it's a good idea uh, to have a three-term councilman or not. And, and just to the comment that council member Sledge made, just because you are an incumbent, it doesn't mean that you're going to get reelected. We have at least three people in this council chamber that defeated an incumbent and got elected to council. So. When you have a three term, doesn't mean that you are guaranteed three terms. You're still going to have to do a good job in the council and, and run against whoever runs against you and win that election. So I, I'm going to agree with Council Member Glover and, and say that I hope that we will give the people of Nashville a chance to vote on this. Thank you. Thank you. Council Lady Henderson. Oh, thank you, Madam President. I guess my point is redundant to Mr. Glover and uh, Mr. Bednay. But I just concur. I mean, we as a legislative body um, need to be a check on the executive, on the mayor, and having those three terms is important um, to that effort. And I think we should um, help our constituents and citizens understand that, because I think this, to Mr. Jameson's point, came in a wave, um, you know, where that uh, was particularly popular nationwide. But what that means for us, particularly as a city with a mayor-dominant form of government, I don't think it behooves us or our citizens to have us term limited it to. 60% of this body came in new last time around. And um, that institutional knowledge is important. Um, so I would encourage colleagues to support this so that the voters can decide. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Rosenberg. Councilman Kendall. Now, this will really sound weird. I, too, agree with uh, <laughs> Mr. Glover. But, <laughs> but, you know, I, I came on this council for the first time in pa this past uh, term, and I consider myself pretty smart. But just trying to learn the jargon, you know, the rules, all the zoning, it almost takes four years, I, I guarantee you. Maybe some of you guys in there are a lot smarter than me. But uh, I stayed on the school board about 27 years, a little over, and I got better and better and better as I stayed on there. But, but I think, as, as Mr. Bednis said and others, we need to let that decision be made by the public because there are a lot of disadvantages to being on this council for just eight years. You know, you, I mean, if you win, you don't, you're not guaranteed, as I said, to win the second term even. I'm not guaranteed. Of course, I don't plan to run three times, so I'm not up here talking to Ed Kendall. Uh, you may see me next time, maybe. But Mr. Sledge, if I were living in your district, I'd want to vote for you. You're a good councilman. You do a good job. But, but I think the public needs to have that opportunity. And as others have said, I think it also deals with the power struggle that, that we have, uh, understand. Because if we're turning over half of this council every turn, at least half, then it weakens, it weakens this body significantly. So I support it. Thank you. Council Lady Karen Johnson. Steve Glover. <laughs> I actually agree with Steve Glover, my former uh, school board colleague and now council colleague, because this makes sense, Council Lady uh, Blaylock. Now, this, I mean, everybody's up now. Everybody's wide awake after I got up and spoke. Now we wide awake on all the amendments. <laughs> but this one is actually good because, one, the voters don't um, understand what we're doing here. They have voted down twice um, extending term limits. So we've got our work cut out uh, for everyone out there to understand the importance of extending term limits for council people uh, because there needs to be a balance of power. Right now, the mayor is the power. Plain and simple, mayor. The council needs to have a check on that. 
And the only way to do that is to have an additional term so they can't maneuver the system because they know a council person is getting ready to come off the council and they can get so many votes or whatever the case may be that gives the administration advantage. There needs to be a check and balance. You know, on other levels, there is no term limits. And I think the public doesn't understand that. So it's going to be incumbent upon all of us to educate everyone. When you're talking about on the congressional level, U.S. Senate level, the state level, where my colleague here is going, there are no term limits. And there's a balance of power, OK? So we need that on the local level as well. So I support this, and I'm going to be a vocal advocate along with all of you. Um, it's not self-serving. They tried to uh, couch that media. The media couched that that way the last time. We need the media's help so that we can have a balance of power in this city. Thank you. Councilman Hastings. Call the question. <laughs> There's been a call for the question. All in favor? Yeah. Opposed? Oh. Call for the question passes. There is a motion before us, Mr. Jameson. This is Charter Amendment E. This would impose term limits for council members of three terms rather than the existing two. Madam Clerk, please open the machine. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Roll call vote. Open the machine. We have to do it. We have to have 27 recorded. Councilman Roten. Madam Clerk, close the machines, please, and tally the vote. I'm sorry, I saw one person voting. Did I miss somebody? No, we're good now. Okay. 37 in favor, two against. Motion passes. We are now on Charter Amendment F. Mr. Jameson. Charter Amendment F would essentially establish gender parity in the Metro Charter. He would be replaced by he or she and so forth. The Charter Commission, which met on this prior to August 7th, approved with an amendment to shorten the text for purposes of the ballot, and there is a pending amendment in your packet at page one. Council Lady Henderson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I would move Amendment A to Amendment F, which follows on what uh, Mr. Jameson said. Uh, it's housekeeping, basically, for language. Thank you. Council Lady Van Reese. Um, yes, uh, identifying as she, her, and hers, um, I wanted to indicate that uh, I think it's important for people to realize the importance of this particular gesture on a number of different levels, uh, particularly um, in support of Amendment D on the oath to uphold the charter, um, which would be uh, detrimental if um, Amendment F does not pass as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Lady Gilmore. I just wanted to rise in support and to say I really appreciate uh, Council Lady Henderson doing that and then the importance of being included in this, in this as women continue to become more engaged in politics and as politics evolves, I think this is very important as we see more women become elected officials across the United States and the role that, that we play and that we are not silenced in the own legislation that we participate in. So I really appreciate you bringing this forth and it's very meaningful, so thank you so much. Okay, everybody remember we are on Amendment A, which is a housekeeping amendment. Correct. So we're not on we're not on F. We're not, our, we're not on Charter Amendment F as amended yet. Okay. So I thought it was F. That's okay. My apologies. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Councilman Withers. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to point out for the room and for the viewing audience that masculine and feminine 
uh, gender pronouns are not the exhaustive list of gender pronouns. So uh, this is a, a good first step, but uh, probably will be one that our society largely and more broadly will continue to discuss. Thank you. Thank you. Council Lady Henderson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I would renew my motion to uh, move Amendment A to Charter Amendment F, please. Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Council Lady Ander Henderson. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Amendment F, as uh, Councilman, uh, or rather, uh, Mr. Jameson uh, shared with you all, takes uh, all the references in our charter uh, at present. If you read our charter, which I know we all have, right, colleagues? Um, every pronoun in there is he. So it's council man, the mayor is a he, the vice mayor is a he. So uh, to uh, Council Lady Gilmore's and uh, Council Lady Van Reese's point, um, I think uh, in 2018, it's important uh, that our charter uh, with 16 women on the council um, a woman having served as mayor, um, a woman having served as vice mayor, uh, that uh, we update uh, the language such that uh, all uh, he's are become he and she or she, and uh, that council man becomes council member, uh, that policeman becomes police officer. Um, and with that explanation, um, I renew my motion uh, to move amendment F as amended. Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to be an ally in the conversation around equity, and I just wanted to uh, express my gratitude to Council Lady Henderson, or rather Council Member Henderson, for bringing uh, this particular amendment, and I am standing in support. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Hurt. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, what about fire person? I mean, a fireman, would it be a firewoman or fire firefighter. person, firefighter? Okay. Yeah, just. Thank you, Councilman Swope. Colico. Now you were the last one. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We are now on the resolution itself as amended, Councilman Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. We have voted for five, uh, to put five amendments on the resolution and we were painfully close to the sixth. Um, so just to be clear, what this does is put these individually on the ballot for the voters to decide. Nothing that we vote for tonight changes anything. All it does is give the people the option to make the decision. Uh, so I move approval of our resolution. Thank you. Council Lady Karen Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. And my uh, councilman, I mean, I'm sorry. Council Attorney Jamison, help me out here. Yes, I move to suspend the rules for B to change eight months back to 12 for district council members if the vacancy occurs the last year of the final term of a term limited council member. Is there any objection to a suspension of the rules? There's two objections, three objections to the suspension of the rules. I'm sorry. Council Lady Erica Gilmore. Yes, Council Member uh, Jamison, I have a uh, question or procedure. Can we move to uh, rescind and move B out? Uh, if it's adopted, you could move to rescind the entire resolution. Mm -hmm. The mo motion to rescind requires two-thirds of the council. All right. So after we have we adopted it yet, or are we about to? No, we've not. Okay. Well, after that, that's what I'm doing. Thank you. Councilman Rosenberg. Oh, sorry. Council Lady Hurt. Thank you, Vice Chair. I am a oh, Vice Mayor. I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I'm a little confused because I think Council Lady Johnson is saying that in her situation that the two elections would still take place with the eight months. And I know that two people objected, and I'm wondering why did they object? Is, is the argument that she's making um, not accurate, or is it 
just for the sake of not allowing it to go back and be heard? I, I can't argue uh, for what the council members' uh, perspectives were. Well, well, can you can you speak on whether what uh, Council Lady Johnson is saying is accurate? Right. I think I would relay what the Charter Commission uh, that that spoke on this um, considered. And when they got to the the proposed originally proposed six month duration for district council members. That was the one term that they ex suggested lengthening. Uh, they approved this 5 and 0, but specifically suggested lengthening it uh, up to nine months. They said eight to nine months. Now there's a, there's a rub. I mean, there's a, a problem uh, that you might encounter for a council member in their last term. Council Lady Johnson is absolutely correct to point that out. Uh, but it rubs up against how long a duration does a district want to live without a district council representative. And the Charter Commission recommended that it be eight to nine months. Council Lady Johnson moved an amendment that made it eight months, and that was adopted by the council. Okay. Councilman Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. Um, speaking to Council Lady Hertz's question, um, we my objection is both substantive and procedural. We'd already voted to put this amendment on um, earlier. Specifically, among the other things that Amendment B does is ensure, in addition to cleaning up and creating the Rosh Hashanah fix, is ensuring that a council district's not without representation for an entire year. Um, speaking for District 35, where Council Lady and Hurt and I both live, we're very familiar with issues that are relevant out there uh, in ways that somebody an at-large potentially from across the county is not an at-large that didn't sign up for that kind of job. Uh, also, I've been getting quite a few calls and emails about how folks would like me to vote on a few particular issues. Without a council member, there's really nobody to speak for the people in that district. And we have a democratically elected council body. I enjoy the fact that we have a democratically elected council body, even if I get frustrated at times. And I think that it's important that we not leave people unrepresented for an entire year at a time. That's a long time. Now, we originally I suggested six months, and I was open to the change the eight months that the Charter Commission suggested and that the Charter Committee also uh, voted in favor of and think that we've landed in a good medium place We've created an amendment where uh, folks will have representation, but we won't have elections too close together, where uh, we clean up the language so there's no ambiguity in our special elections so that the election commission can create elections at the time the charter dictates, uh, even when it's, uh, even when Rosh Hashanah or Ramadan might get in the way, as was the case in 2007. Um, and uh, with that, I'm, I'm fully supportive of the council's actions on these, of not deciding that it's gonna be how it is, but giving the people of Nashville the right to make the decision, giving people the right to vote. Um, and uh, that's that, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Elrod. Pass. Councilor De Gilmore. Thank you. I think what the uh, Council Lady Johnson is sharing, though, that is some council members would still have to run twice either way if it's their last year, which could be, in fact, burdensome and not be a part of democracy if you have to run two times. And I think that's the issue. She's not talking about whether it's eight or eight months or 12 months. It's still that that person, and under this particular rule, as we understand it, and under um, Attorney Jameson's interpretation, is that a council member would have to run twice. Isn't that correct, and, uh, Mr. Jamison, or am I misunderstanding it? I, I understood what Council Lady Johnson, and I would welcome her clarification. I thought what she was asking about is take a council member who was in their last term, the last year of their last term, and something happens. They have to resign, and they leave more than eight months before the end of that term. The people who are gearing up to succeed her would start pulling petitions in February, and that conundrum uh, is, I think, what concerns Council Lady Johnson. But then they would have to come back, so they would run in February, and then they would come back and run in August. 
Is that correct? Well, so they would run, there'd be a special election set because with more than eight months, the election commission sets a special election. And then, yeah, their, their term would end in August. And that's, that's the other side to how long do you leave the council seat open without representation? Okay, so I think that's her question and that's the issue. And so I think if we could move to just correct that part, that seems a little burdensome to have someone to run in February that are pull, that, that who is pulling papers and then to come back again in August to do it. I don't know that if that's the goal of what we want to do, that's, that's a little bit burdensome. And so I would just ask uh, Council Member Rosenberg to think about that part of it. It's not so much the vacancy, it's the running twice in the last term if something happens. And I think that is the issue, and that is something that we need to think about for anybody who wants to participate, because uh, running for office is very expensive, no matter if you're a district at large, mayor, vice mayor, and it, bec it can become very burdensome and prohibitive. So I, I think that's what I would ask us all to look at, and I think that, in fact, is the issue. It's not the issue of the vacancy. It's the issue of how much time and energy it would take to run for a $16,000 job. Okay, and with that, um, oh, I'm sorry, 15000 No, 14000 Oh, 13,000? Oh, I'm sorry, when you stay 2 a.m. in the morning, five cents an hour. Okay, thank you, I, 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 uh, I, thank you very much. Councilman Swope. Thank you, Madam President. Given this is a very extraordinary year in this city for elections, and that we're all sick of voting, I think the real question here is, is Councilor Jamison? I'm sorry, yes, sir, I was no worries. talking to my good friend. <clears throat> I think the real question here is, is when these charter amendments, amendments are voted on on November 6th on a referendum, when would they actually take effect? Uh, well, the, this particular rule would take effect when the Election Commission has an election before it, subsequent to November 6th of 2018. So um, if there's a special election, otherwise the implementation would be the following August for the elections. So in other words, if we pass this as is with eight months, window, this would not affect Council Lady Johnson's district and or possibly Council Lady Wiener's district this coming year, correct? Correct. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that. Thanks. Council Lady Johnson, I mean, uh, Karen Johnson. Again, <laughs> this is not about me. I'm asking Council... Attorney Jamison, in a future scenario, and the person is in their last year of their term limited term, the last year, if it's, if it's less than 12 months, it's eight months, when does that person pull papers to run? When does the person who succeeds you? When does the person when, who when it when they went okay, if somebody resigns, they may get sick and they resign and it's the eight month threshold and say they resigned in August. When would the election be for that? The elect well, just to use this year, the election will still be August of 19. You would pull papers as you ordinarily, other people would pull papers as they ordinarily would as early as February. There would be a special election for the person who actually succeeds you. And that special election, when would you pull papers? Well, the election commission would set a date. They have a period of time that they set by state law within a range, I think it's 75 to 80 days, and it would depend on actual when the resignation took place. Okay, so they would pull papers, what, September? Probably. Okay, so they would pull papers in September and they would give them a deadline, say October. Then the election would probably be set November. So then they would serve November, December, January. Then in February, they'll win. They'll serve three months. They'll win. 
served three months, and then in February, as a three-month council member, they then have to pull papers to run for August. Right, but they, they continue serving through August regardless. They continue serving through August, but they've got to pull papers to run with everybody else in February. Correct. This is what I'm trying to get you all to understand. That is very confusing for a district. You may get somebody that just may have an advantage. I don't know if it's financially or what have you. They get elected, serve three months, and then all of a sudden the qualifying deadline, everybody's gonna be paying attention to all council districts in the city open up for election that year in February. And those elections will be held in August. So that person that's sitting there for three months is gonna have to pull papers along with everybody else that may be interested in running in February. And you've got a sitting council member who served for three months running with everybody else for the August election. That is a lot of confusion and that's why I asked, could you all have made this particular amendment? We were all sleep at the wheel because we were going through all these amendments so fast, nobody knew what was going on. Council lady. Stand by just a minute. Count Mr. Jamison, would you please share when that was actually voted on? Uh, this particular amendment was voted on at the August 7th council meeting. The amendment to the charter amendment was voted on August 7th. The charter amendment as amended was voted on tonight. Right, because we got up and spoke the last meeting and that was why it was changed to an amendment to eight months. But in a term, in the final year of a term limited council member's term, I had asked that that be considered for B. And that was ignored. Again, this requires 27 votes. And with 27, I hate to defeat um, the vet Blaylock's thing and some other things, but because nobody wants to work with other people, I guess it is what it is. Thank you, Council Lady. Councilman Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. Um, that was a lot of words, but this is all very straightforward. We, we voted to, uh, for Amendment A to create a temporary, to allow the Metro Council to elect a temporary placeholder in the event that both the mayor and vice mayor are unable to, will, unwilling to serve. An amendment that cleans up 1503, does the Rosh Hashanah fix, and allows somebody to be elected for eight months instead of a district remaining vacant, they can currently be elected for 12 months. So it's a pretty limited change. Amendment D modifies the Metro Oath of Office. E allow, uh, would uh, change the term limit and Amendment F would add feminine pronouns and create some gender neutral references. Um, all these choices would go to the voters. We're not changing anything tonight. Um, and it's generally a good idea to let the people decide how long they want to, uh, how they want to handle their government and how they'd like their founding document to be managed. And I think that we should give them that choice. Thank you. Council Lady Henderson. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I rise in support of this resolution as currently amended. I think we worked our way through all these amendments and respectfully, we have been paying attention. And um, I think, again, respectfully, you can talk about a hypothetical situation. Um, and I think we have, and uh, Councilman Rosenberg, the Charter Revision uh, Commission, the Charter Revision Committee, um, has thought through all the unintended consequences and hypotheticals that this year brought to bear, a very unique year for Metro government. A lot of hard work and intention has gone into this. And with all due respect to this hypothetical scenario, if the voters choose that they uh, do not want to have to wait a full year to be duly represented, then if someone were hypothetically in their last term at the end of the year and something were to happen and so forth, they can make the choice, given the constraints as they understand them, to resign at a certain time that does not incur all the issues that Council Lady Johnson was speaking to. So we are 
as a body working to fine tune our charter, but we cannot fine tune it to the teeniest nth degree. And so I would ask colleagues to be respectful of all the work that has done, been done and not let a last minute hypothetical put this effort asunder. Thank you. Councilman Freeman. Call the question. There's a motion to call the question. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Mr. Jamison, would you recap and then we will vote. You are now on the final resolution with the five approved amendments. Uh, amendment A, which created the line of succession. Uh, amendment B, as amended, uh, the durations of the special election vacancies that trigger special elections. Amendment D, which creates the oath of office uh, requirement for the Metropolitan Charter. Amendment E, term limits for council members extended to three terms, and Amendment F, gender parity. This will require 27 votes. Madam Clerk, please open the machine. Do we have a problem? Okay. Okay, Madam Clerk, please close the machine and tally the vote. Thirty-eight in favor and none against. Thank you. Okay. There is a motion to rescind on the floor. Is there a second? There's a second. Okay, Council Lady Gilmore, did you want to speak? I've still got you in the queue. Sure. Um, I think just quickly, uh, Sharon, I was trying to count and make sure that I had the number of women that were on the floor. I think there's a couple of things that deal with this amendments. I, I appreciate the hard work, but the reason I was counting because I was li listening to we talked about um, term limits, extending those, and just a lot of different issues. And I think people in the, uh, in the public don't really understand how the council works. So one thing I wanted to address was the term limits, and then I'll come back and share the last piece. A lot of people don't realize that the council is a 40-member body without people that are, have the ability to do research, PR, you know, we got this big MLS coming before us. We, we do the, our, the research ourselves. Uh, some of the members are retired, some are not. And I think for women specifically, a lot of the, if you're married, um, a lot of the burdens usually fall on you. You've got childhood duties. I mean, so it's a deeper issue that we're talking about, depending on what community you come from. So we're talking about equity. And so that's why I'm rescinding this, because I, as I shared, um, it's, 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 it doesn't pay a lot, but you do it because you love it. And for people who don't come, if you don't have a, long, a, a strong support system, it is very difficult to be a council member and to be an effective one. And we most recently cut our professional development. So I just wanted to share with people, if you don't believe in those uh, extending the term limits, or if you do believe in it, you need to vote to have more staff so that you can be efficient and work on behalf of your people. So a lot of times council members get ca caught out there and they do is because we don't don't really have the proper staff, and we can have it. The staff we have is good, but we need more staff for a 40-member body, okay? So we just have to be very transparent here. And so to move to the last piece of what uh, Council Member Johnson was sharing, what a lot of people don't understand is, if you don't come from means, or if you don't have support in the community, it is very difficult. So when you look at the council and you look at the makeup of it, it'll never really change in terms of women when we think about uh, that piece and the, uh, the point of view of women where they come from, unless you come from a, a place of wealth or something like that, or certain communities. So all these things do make a difference when we're talking about running twice in one year. It's very expensive when you start buying those signs and commercials and door knockings to be, we're talking about being effective and not just running a race. So to bring it back around, I am um, asking that this piece for the eight months be uh, 
amend it? Can we can we amend that council member and then put it back in there and vote on all? Can we can we? I mean, I'm sorry, attorney. Can we amend this piece or just pull this? this be out? You would be rescinding the, re the resolution. Okay, so I'm going to ask that we rescind the whole resolution and if, can it be um, coming, excuse me? I'm, I, I have the floor right now and, I, and I'm making, a, I've made my motion and I'm still speaking and my time is not up. But we have a point of order. Yeah. It's a parliamentary point of order. Okay. He has the floor. Council, uh, Mr. Jameson, if we were to entertain a motion to rescind right now, would that possibly kill all the work on the charter amendments that we've done and further open up the opportunity so that in future council meetings, folks were compelled to band together to block all. Uh, that's block, not parliamentary, that that's the things. merits of the bill. That's not a parliamentary move right there. I'm sorry. It's a <clears> question <throat> about whether this is a tactic that could be used on other legislation in the future and whether it would kill this resolution due to the time constraints. This okay, is the merits so of the bill. So what we're gonna do, everybody, we're going to calm down and we're going to let Mr. Jameson answer the parliamentary procedure question that is also pertinent to what Council Lady Gilmore is sharing. We're both asking the same exact thing. Mr. Jameson. Rule 36 of the Council rule says one sentence, any affirmative action of the Council may be rescinded by two-thirds vote of the full membership of the Council, 27 votes. The affirmative action was the adoption of the resolution as a whole, so you cannot uh, cherry pick. It's the resolution up or down. Mr. O'Connell. I get, may, this might be also parliamentary. Or, or do we, even though it's, I don't believe in council rules, is there a, an opportunity to uh, amend the previously adopted from Robert's rules? No? no. Okay. There was a, a, a motion to make the amendment that's being sought, a suspension of the rules request was requested and that failed. Councilman Chilman. Thank you, Madam President. I, I think Mr. Jameson might be helpful just kind of explain. So you just read rule 36, which is the motion to rescind action. So maybe just for purposes of explaining, um, th there's a motion to rescind on the floor. Uh, it's been made. So if, if it is made and seconded and discussed and the motion to rescind is passed with 27 affirmative votes, then what procedurally, where are we? Because we've rescinded our action, does that mean, because um, I understand what the council lady is trying to do, she's trying to go back and fix something. Right. It's as where as are we? It's as if the resolution wasn't filed. It's, it's over. Now, what Councilman Rosenberg could then do would be uh, essentially start over again um, he would likely not be able to capture the November 6th election for cost-saving purposes uh, for the charter amendment. There is, a, there is a particular section of state law that allows the election commission the discretion that if a special election falls within 90 days of November 6th, they can combine it, but that's totally within their discretion. We can't mandate that. All right, um, Madam President, one other uh, question. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, for purposes of discussion, if, if this were approved, if we got the 27 vote, we would, we would go on to the next item of business and we would just have rescinded everything that we just did? Correct. Okay. So then the second question is, there's a concern floating around at this point. This is the first thing that we have actually, this is the first attempt, we're allowed to do two during a council term. This is the first attempct to actually amend the charter. Right, but, Correct. But rescinding it would eliminate it. It's, 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 I understand, it's, but uh, uh, assuming that we don't do that uh, and we pass it, if there's a need to address it again, I, I'm guessing that we can bring another measure to address the concern that's been expressed. And then we have to figure out where that goes in terms of the proper procedure. That's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Council Lady Mina Johnson. Thank you, Madam Vice President. And uh, I am not in favor of rescinding uh, motion. Uh, here's uh, two reasons. One, it will uh, put all the hard work by charter committee and a meeting and so forth to uh, just pretty much trash can. And I think it would be so disrespectful. Another point is, uh, I do appreciate uh, the point raised by Council Member uh, Karen Johnson and Council Member uh, 
Gilmore, but I think uh, they are looking at the different point. Yes, I admit running for the office is a hard work. Running for the office takes our financial. However, the question we are asking is each district, our constituent, do we want this uh, uh, position to be vacant eight months or do we want this position to be okay to be 12 months? So if district member, uh, citizen feel like, yes, we want our district council member uh, to be filled within eight months, they will vote in favor. But you know, uh, the district, uh, the voters of this uh, Davidson County feels like, no, we can do without a district council member here, they will vote it down. So that's all we are asking. So it's not up to us to decide eight months, 12 months, how much money it will take or so forth. It's up to the Davidson County, up to our constituent to decide that our district can seat to be vacant for 12 months or eight months. So that's all there to it. I think you are thinking in the wrong way. So, so with all due respect, I do not support rescinding motion. Thank you, Council Lady. Councilman O'Connell. So does that mean you're not speaking? Gotcha. Councilman Glover. Just very quickly, uh, obviously we've spent a lot of time talking about this. I, I want to understand the 90 day uh, piece of that, if, if, if it was rescinded, explain the 90 days, if you would, on, on exactly how that, so in other words, if, if you're saying we don't do it tonight, if we come back at next and we make it work, then that's within the window for the election commission? Right, it's a, it's a discretionary window for the election commission. So if you have a, 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 a special election for any purpose, uh, you, um, most people try to schedule it so that it falls in line with a, a general election or some other scheduled election for cost saving purposes, obviously. Mm -hmm. So if you, the election commission, the state law then requires you to file it at least 80 days before that and have it delivered at least 75 days before that special uh, or general election date. But there is a catch all at the bottom that gives the election commission the discretion. It's not mandatory, it's their call. If you miss that window and your special election falls within 90 days of that general election, the election commission does have discretion to bring it back up so that it matches, for example, November 6th or whatever. They would probably look at what capability they have, what staffing ability they have, and see if they can make it work. But that's. That's okay, so so I'm gonna I'm gonna translate it in layman's terms. Let's just make sure I understand this. So if this happened to be rescinded tonight, um, and wanted to come back at the next council meeting, and it was voted on and it passed, then and we handed it off to the election commission, they would have at their discretion to put it on the ballot for November the sixth. Am I correct? That's correct. Perfect. Thank you, Council Lady Blaylock. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Mike Jameson. Do you have a question? Yeah, for Mike. Go ahead. Um, Mike. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> so my question is, like um, we had mentioned earlier, we can actually add another charter amendment and start working that as soon as next council meeting to potentially change this amendment and if we do not rescind this. And also, um, when the people go to the, to the ballots to vote, they're gonna be voting individually on all of these items, is that correct? That is correct. Each one will appear as a separate item on the ballot for them to vote on one by one. Right, that's what I wanted to know, thank you. Seeing no one else in the queue, we're going to move to the vote. We're gonna do a roll call vote. Please open the machines. This requires 27 votes. This yeah, yeah, we're gonna let Mr. Jameson explain. This is Council Lady Gilmore's motion to rescind the resolution that was adopted 1314. This will take uh, 27 votes. If you are in favor of rescinding it, you would vote for the motion.
Madam Clerk, please close the machine and tally the vote. Three in favor, 33 against, two abstentions. Okay, motion to rescind fails. We are now on resolution RS 2018, 1356. Sponsor is Glover. Expresses the intention of the Metro Council to suspend action on any agreement related to any lease and redevelopment of the Nashville Fairgrounds until all necessary procedures have been completed. Councilman Glover. Do, do I need to request uh, committee reports again? Yes, please. All right. Okay, I'm getting yes and no. Do we, so I do or do not? Yes. Okay, all right. Council Lady Bircher. Thirteen fifty six. Um, Mr. James, I don't have that committee report. I don't believe. That's yeah. my question. I'm sorry. I read it wrong. That's my fault. I apologize. Okay. Councilman Glover. Okay. Sorry. All right. Well, I know that we're all having a good time tonight. I spent a lot of time talking. So uh, at the sake of hopefully getting out of here before midnight, I'm going to drop this one and I'm, I'm going to withdraw this one because I think we've got some other issues that we'll talk about and uh, spend our time on that. So with that, I respectfully ask to withdraw. Motion is withdrawn. A resolution is withdrawn. We are on resolution RS 2018-1367. Council Lady Bircher. This one was deferred by rule, so we will move to resolution RS 2018-1368. Council Lady Bircher and Van Reese, this one too was deferred by rule. We're on resolution RS 2018-1369, sponsors Bircher and Gilmore, approves a grant from the Greater Nashville Regional Council to the Metro Social Services Commission to provide meals that meet RDA nutritional guidelines and transportation services to eligible seniors and handicapped residents. Council Lady Bircher. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, budget and finance recommended approval, nine, four, zero against, one not voting, and I'll move for approval. Council Lady, Council Lady I'm Gilmore. I'm sorry, committee report. That's okay. Council Lady Gilmore. Thank you. Health, hospitals, and social services uh, voted uh, in favor for, a zero against, and it was recommended for approval. Thank you. Councilman Chilman. Thank you, Madam President. I just need to be recorded as um, not voting and recusing myself. Thank you. Seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We are now on resolution RS 2018-1372. Sponsors Cooper and Vercher. Um, Councilman Cooper. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, um, President Pratim, uh, move for withdrawal of 1372. Council Lady Birch, you want to give a quick committee report, please? Thank you, Madam President. At the request of the sponsors, uh, the resolution was withdrawn. Thank you. There is a motion to withdraw. All in favor? Opposed? <laughs> motion passes. We are on RS 2018-1373. Sponsors Cooper and Vercher. According to rules, Rule 16, no action may be taken. Councilman Cooper. Uh, move for a one meeting deferral pursuant to that. Okay. There's a motion for a one meeting deferral and this was referred to budget and finance so we need to get a quick committee report. Council Lady Vercher. Thank you, Madam President. It was deferred by rule. We have a one meeting deferral. One. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We are now on bills on first reading. Do I have a motion to accept all bills on first reading? All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. We're now on bills on second reading. BL 2018, 1188, sponsors Cooper and Bircher. 
amends the Metro Code by inserting a new subsection into Chapter 2.24 to establish procedures for high value real property transactions. Councilman Cooper. Thank you. Uh, move to defer to the second meeting in October. Council Lady Birch, you want to give us a committee report? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Budget and Finance uh, recommended a referral to, October, to the second meeting in October, 12 4 0 against. Thank you, Councilman Cooper. Moving to? Move to the defer to the second meeting in October. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1190 sponsors O'Connell, Allen, and Syracuse. Amends the Metro Code to provide free parking at public parking meters in Davidson County for environmentally friendly vehicles and for vehicle owners that purchase carbon offsets. Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to request committee reports, please. Councilman Hager. <laughs> Parking and traffic approved, 440 again. Councilman O'Connell. Uh, I thought we had a one meeting deferral on this one out of committee. <laughs> yep. That's okay because I am, uh, that's, uh, I totally appreciate it and I was not at the committee which, uh, which contributed to the confusion there. So um, with that, I'd like to actually move to defer indefinitely with a brief explanation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam President. I would, uh, on this one, we've got basically it is half baked and we're waiting on uh, a, a recipe that we don't know how long it's going to take uh, to bake the rest of it. So we're, um, it's kind of a two part bill where we've got a piece that speaks to what happens when you opt in. Uh, on the vehicle ownership side and then you know, for equity reasons, making sure that there is a pathway uh, for anybody to opt in. And that is the piece that is, is waiting on some uh, issues related to the tree bank, which are still uh, in process. So we will probably revisit this at such time as we've got a functional offset program. But the, at this point, the status quo will stand. So we have um, a, a limited uh, current permit program uh, that people can still take advantage of with a not particularly meaningful offset. I do think this is worth revisiting at a later time, but we'll wait till we have a, a higher quality uh, offset piece to revisit it. Thank you. There's a motion to defer indefinitely. Properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We are on substitute bill 2018-1203. Councilman Rosenberg amends the Metro Code relating to scooters, inline skates, and roller skates by defining scooter and removing certain requirements. Councilman Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. Committee reports, please. Councilman Elrod. Public works recommended approval. Six in favor, zero against, as substituted. Councilman Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this is the uh, little sibling of Councilman Elrod's uh, scooter bill that's on third reading tonight. Um, this, r right now we have code that treats motorized and unmotorized scooters identically. Uh, it requires all riders of those to, to wear wrist guards and has language that's in inconsistent with uh, BL 2018-1202 that we'll be considering on third reading tonight. Uh, so this does a few things. It creates definitions for motorized and non-motorized scooters and clarifies that this section uh, does not pertain to the SUMDs that we'll be uh, considering later on, uh, reduces the safety equipment that needs to be worn, no more risk guards, um, and also lays out the areas in which they can be ridden on sidewalks to be consistent with, uh, for motorized scooters to be consistent with the shared motorized scooters, the SUMDs, and in the case of kids' razor scooters to be a little more permissive. Uh, so I move the second substitute, please. Is there a second? second? Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes, Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, move approval, thank you. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. We're on BL 2018-1205. Sponsor Glover prohibits Metro government from approving or entering into the sale, lease, transfer, or conveyance of property adjacent to proposed Major League Soccer Stadium to any third party for purposes of private development. Councilman Glover. Uh, committee reports, please. Council Lady Vercher. 
Madam President, uh, Budget and Finance uh, recommended no recommendation, six for, six against. Councilman Swope. Codes, fares, and farmers market voted against this. Zero votes for it, five against, one non-voting. Councilman, Council Lady Hurt. Thank you, Vice Chair. The um, Conventions, Tourism, and Public Entertainment Facilities Committee voted against one, four, two against, and two not voting. Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. This has bothered me from the very beginning, and now if you would stick with me for just a second, and let me tell you why it's bothered me. The argument has been that the 10 acres is absolutely necessary in order for this deal to work. So I started pondering, work for who? Because, and I got the answer today, and Mr. Harmon, if I may ask you this question, I, I don't want them to take my word for it. A $62 million uh, bond here, uh, the, the numbers you gave me was about $4.6 million a year to repay it over a 20-year span. Uh, yes, uh, $62 million cumulative over 20 years. Uh, the debt service on that was about $4.6 million each year. Yeah, give, give or take, yeah. I mean, and obviously we don't know the exact uh, interest rate or anything else. So it, again, made me ponder, okay, for who is this 10 acres really needed for in order to make the deal work? Well, I keep coming back to the same thing. It's, it's for the people we're going to let use the, the property. We can talk about are we giving it away, are we doing this, are we doing that, because the administration told us yesterday in budget and finance that the anticipated gross off of this for uh, property taxes will be to about $2 million. Am I correct? Was that what the number was yesterday? Okay. So $2 million, but a million of that will go to the fairgrounds. The other million will come to general services, and we pay our debt service out of our operating funds. So I have worked this through a thousand different ways in my mind. I keep coming up with we, we the people, we the owners of the property, we the taxpayers are going to pick up about $3.6 million a year. Because we don't truly know what sales tax may be or what we're going to get out of that. I mean, we've, we've, got, we've got really kind of hard numbers on just the property tax piece if we take what the administration has told us. So that's really what, I mean, and I'm just telling you, that's what really led me to say, are we doing a real estate deal here for somebody? Or are we doing a soccer deal? And so with that, I, I mean, we've, we've hashed this thing through uh, considerably in committees, and I know we, we've been here for quite a while and, and talking about, but I think we need to understand why are we including it? Are we including it to where the city can at least break even? Are we including it to where the developers will make a very hefty pro uh, profit? So with that in mind, I renew and I, I would ask people to support this and let's remove the 10 acres out of this, uh, the deal. Thank you. Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Uh, so I wanna kinda get, go through a couple of different pieces here. Um, one, uh, <laughs> regarding this 10 acres piece, what's been projected, and, and I do want to just kind of on the floor remind everybody that there's the public hearing and second vote regarding the rezoning that pertains to this mixed-use development Monday, 27th at 6 p.m. back in these chambers. Um, so, so a couple of things. One, regarding folks who, who are going to use the property. Well, everyone's going to use the property. It has a promenade. It has public space available. And it has things that are being discussed right now from housing to retail to community space. Um, there is wide open use for a lot of this property. I understand the property tax splits. I would argue that that's something of a good thing. We're adding a million dollars or more a year to the fairgrounds budget, to the fairgrounds budget that typically runs about 3.2 to 3.5 million a year. So that's a 33% increase in the fairgrounds annual budget from the property tax revenues coming from this. On sales tax projections, I think it's fair to say that we need to be cautious about sales tax projections. I think it's also fair to say that when the development is created, the sales tax projections won't be zero. So there will be tax revenue that comes in that this body will be able to make decisions on every year in its budget. And then to the, the biggest question on why are we including this, 
think it's twofold. I think it's functional and I think it's philosophical. The functional piece is that, as we are seeing, when you talk about putting a facility like this, a sports facility nearby, there is a need for nearby development. And we have seen in the city that sometimes it has happened naturally on its own, and sometimes it has not. Um, and I think that it's important that when we have the opportunity to do this, because it is the city land that we're talking about creating a lease for, which we'll be talking about in subsequent legislation, uh, we, get a, we get a lot more say in what occurs there. And the biggest discussion that's going on right now is actually one that we're not part of, but I think is pretty darn important, and that's regarding the community benefits agreement conversation. You'll hear me say this on subsequent bills as well. We didn't, there is not a community benefits agreement in place. That agreement would be between Nashville Soccer Holdings and the community, community advocacy group Stand Up Nashville. I, they are making a lot of progress. Um, and I would not say that unless they would allow me to say that. And they allowed me to say that today. Um, so I am asking that this body um, remove, this, remove this question mark from our conversations. If you don't feel like the 10 acres is worth doing, there is legislation to vote against. There is that legislation that if you don't feel like it's worth doing, then you can vote against it. But I don't believe that this is the proper way to, I don't think this is where we wanna do it. Because if you take this out, then we don't, we don't have that conversation anymore. Our community isn't able to have that conversation anymore, and we're not, be able to, we're not able to listen to our community having that conversation anymore. So respectfully, I would ask that we vote against this resolution, or this bill, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Councilman Scott Davis. Councilman Pardue, you, know, you came up. Councilman Glover. Just very quickly, I was under the impression, and if I need to defer this to next Monday night for the for the public hearing, I'm, I'm happy to do that, but it was my understanding that this would not be able to be heard next Monday night. That's correct. Okay, so. Can't. Well, no, I'm just, I'm again, I'm, I'm listening to what's being said here, and I'm trying to make sure that I'm following along. So with that, again, I, re I re renew my motion to approve, and if we could, a machine vote, please. Council Lady Henderson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I, I apologize. I didn't uh, know that uh, Councilman Glover is going to renew there. I just um, I want to speak somewhat in support of this, but I am torn. Um, I think we have expressed uh, to the administration um, and to our constituents in the community uh, ever since we passed our, our vote in favor of uh, soccer in Nashville, and I am in favor of soccer in Nashville, that our biggest heartburn as a body was these 10 acres. And so to be at this juncture, um, this far down the road, and not have any more clarity on these 10 acres is concerning to me. And so I ask you all to consider, uh, you know, 10 acres is, is a lot of land. So we look hypothetically, as an example, Fifth and Broadway downtown um, at the corner there with their food hall and their office building and housing and all that. That's six acres. So why perhaps is five acres not needed? Uh, should this five acres be adjacent to the neighborhood and so on and so forth? Where is the structured parking gonna be? These are things that came up at budget and finance yesterday. So I'm somewhat torn because I think uh, Councilman Glover, with all due respect, this is you know pretty definitive. I would like, and I hope I did that through my budget and finance vote uh, yesterday, uh, to show that members of this body still have concerns related to those 10 acres and that more clarity is needed. Um, perhaps it's just five acres that are needed to have everything work together um, on that site um, and have soccer be there and all the existing uses. Um, I, again, uh, I think it remains to be seen and I don't feel like we've had uh, sufficient conversation um, in this body. I don't serve on the Codes and Fair Commission um, I've watched everything, I've read everything, I read the 77 page appraisal for block A, block B, block C, and all, so on and so forth. Um, and I'm not convinced that 10 acres are needed. We keep hearing that, 10 acres are needed, 10 acres are needed. If we don't do the 10 acres, the whole deal falls apart. Um, but I don't think we've seen any particular proof that they are indeed. I think to Councilman Sledge's uh, assertion that uh, 
I think we all understand that some kind of catalyzing uh, related retail and so forth might be helpful, um, but uh, I would like to see um, the administration and those folks who are the proponents of this to come with more detail as it relates to uh, these 10 acres. And so I appreciate uh, this uh, bill for bringing this discussion, and I'm still somewhat in a quandary as to whether to support it because I find it's somewhat overly definitive, um, but I did want to use the opportunity to express uh, lingering concerns about the 10 acres and the need for more clarity. Thank you. Councilman John Cooper. Um, thank you. Um, very quickly, what's left out of here is the principle that this is an affirmative taking of public land cherished by thousands of people for more than 100 years. You are taking it. it Folks. Is Folks, it's five after nine. You we have a lot of work to do. We want to make sure that this body has the opportunity to deliberate. So I would again appreciate everyone in the back being quiet and let us get through this, please. Councilman Cooper. You shouldn't do a wrong because you're trying to do a right. It's public land, it's cherished, and we shouldn't be grading users and say, you're not qualified, you can't have it, and we're gonna give it to somebody else. We've preserved it and cherished it for more than a hundred years. It is fundamental to Nashville. And that's principle of protecting it is important for this body to uphold. Councilman Withers. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Just a question for Mr. Jamison. Uh, different pieces of legislation take have different effects when you vote on them at different readings. Uh, would you uh, inform the body what practical effect would approving or disapproving this bill on second reading tonight have? Uh, well, it wouldn't have a, a binding effect on second. Um, you don't. Uh, you simply need a majority of those members uh, voting uh, in support of it. It would be third and final reading where it has to be consistent with the other legis legislation that is adopted or not. So this is not something like pending legislation or anything like that that, no. that would preclude other discussion and other Correct. Bills. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Councilman Scott Davis. I made a promise to someone that I would, I would let this go to second reading. And I'm going to vote to get the stadium to second reading so we can see the community benefits agreement and also so we can make some amendments if needed, give Stand Up Nashville their chance to do their work, and they do it well, and do it for the community. However, I have to give the same respect to my colleague that I've sat here with for seven years, who is a good man and a good friend of mine. And even though we, don't dis we, we disagree on some things and we agree on some things, and just from Attorney Jameson, if we vote yes on this tonight, it doesn't make it by anyway, Mr. Withers said, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So I'm gonna give the same respect, you know, cause this is a torn issue you know, to his piece of legislation. Because we talk about treating each other fairly and the voters have the right to debate this and we have the right to continue to look at this. And just like um, Councilor Henderson, I'm torn on this stadium. And, and I'm happy the work that Councilman Sledge and Stand Up Nashville are doing. However though, and, you know, we need something to continue the positive work. So I can't say, hey, I'm gonna move this, I'm gonna vote to move um, the soccer stadium forward without giving Glover my, the same respect too. So I just want us to remember this. So if we vote yes on this tonight, this, this, has to, this goes to effect September, the September 5th meeting, Mr. Jameson? September 4th, excuse me, pardon me. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Councilman Pulley. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Uh, briefly, I would say that there's a, a lot of debate yet, yet to be had on this. And as Councilman Sledge pointed out, uh, we've got two pieces of legislation coming up. 
uh, on which if you disagree with the 10 acres, you uh, certainly have the ability to weigh in then. Uh, I think it's very important that we understand that uh, there is some there are unanswered questions out there, but there's a lot of work being conducted right now uh, to try to get the resolutions for those answers. And uh, I would submit to you that uh, I'm not going to support this because I believe there's another way to get uh, to that uh, issue if you wanted to vote against the 10 acres. Uh, I think it's very important that we advance uh, the legislation supporting the, uh, the soccer stadium in second reading so that we can have the public hearing, hear from them, and then have a robust debate amongst ourselves at the appropriate time, which would be third reading on those bills. So again, I would just call uh, to vote against this and uh, and deal with the 10 acres on the other two pieces of legislation that's coming forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Kendall. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, I've also been conflicted on this. Uh, I was in the uh, committee meeting this, this evening when Mr. Glover, uh, this was brought up, and we had some discussion on it. I think voted five against uh, approving this. I'm not, you know, in my district, we don't talk about soccer a lot. And that doesn't mean we don't care about soccer. You know, we, we like soccer too. But we talk about wages. We talk about housing. We talk about what's happening with the minority business community. And I see this really, this 10 acres, Mr. Glover, and I, as I expressed earlier, as an opportunity for this city to prove and demonstrate that we are serious about those things, about affordable housing, about minority participation in the business community, and about wages. I see it as an opportunity. I see that as an opportunity through the uh, community benefit uh, plan. And, but I'm concerned that that hasn't happened. You know, when I hear people talk about, and I've heard figures thrown around like 10%, affordable housing, workforce housing, whatever you want to call it. I'm not happy with that, you know. And I'll just be very honest, I, I, I want to express those things. I'm not happy with token kind of minority participation in a project. And I know token participation when I see it. I've been around long enough to know that. So this is coming up for third. I'm going to vote for it tonight because third reading, I think, when it's important that we, we, we consider those things. But I expect at that time, Mr. Sledge, I hope that we will have answers to these. I mean, I'll be very honest, I'm looking at 20, 25, 30% affordable housing. And within that context, some way that we can have covenants or whatever in those uh, uh, deeds to ensure it continues that way. And that somebody doesn't come along and change all of that to, uh, to uh, higher price. But anyway, I'm going to vote for it tonight, but I, I'm keeping my eye on that, and I really want to, because I won't vote for it if none of this happens. Because I agree, and Mr. Cooper, I don't think we've given away 10 acres. I mean, we've given away a lot in this city, and I haven't seen the kind of results of, of participation uh, that I'm talking about. I haven't seen the, the housing. We give away uh, things to developers, et cetera, and I don't see what we're asking for even in this benefit agreement. So I, that's what I want to express tonight. I would not vote for it on third reading if we don't have those things. Thank you. Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. I just want to respond to a couple of things colleagues brought up. And I, and I think the points are fair. Um, I certainly, you know, wish I was standing here before you tonight and we knew, that every, we knew everything that was in an agreement and, and knew that everybody was on the same page. Not there tonight, but I, I think we're getting there. I totally um, echo everything Councilman Kendall has said that I expect the same level of, of commitment. Um, what, I, what, I would, what I would put to members is just that in a lot of things that we do, perception becomes reality. And I think that the perception I hear from the colleague, from, from you, is that you want to see the things done that Councilman Kendall and other members have mentioned. Um, I want to see those too. And I want to give the perception the impression from this council that that is what we want to see. We want to see proactive, impressive work done in a conversation between our community and the, and the team. Um, 
my concern is that if we go forward with this bill tonight, it sends the wrong impression, it sends the wrong perception. And like I said, perception can become reality. Um, these things are hard enough as it is. Um, while we're talking tonight about the potential for agreement very soon, but not, but not here tonight. So that's why I would ask that let's keep things moving in a direction that we feel like is going to create the right perception for what we want to see, not just for, for this, but for things done down the road as well. Thank you. Councilman Pardue. Hang on. It's second time tonight you cut me off. I'm sorry. I can get this kind of treatment at home. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> I'd like to call for the question, please. There's a motion to call for the question. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We're on the bill. Madam Clerk, please open the machine. Councilman Potts. Madam Clerk, please close the machine to have vote. 15 in favor, 18 against, six abstentions. Motion fails. We are on BL 2018-1289, sponsor Sledge and Bercher, approves the demolition of buildings and structures for the construction of a new major league soccer stadium at the Fairgrounds Nashville and amends the Metro Code to impose a privilege tax on the sale of tickets to events at the new major league soccer stadium. Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Committee reports, please. Council Lady Bercher. Thank you, Madam President. Budget and Finance recommended disapproval, seven against, five four. Councilman Swope. On twelve eighty nine, Codes Fair and Farmers Market recommended approval, five four zero against, one not voting, with a re, re referral to Codes. Councilman Hager. Um, Bargain and traffic approved, four four zero against. Council Lady Hurt. Very quick point of order. This didn't go to traffic and parking. No, it's, right on. it's, it's okay. <laughs> you know what? Convention. It's typed here wrong, and I totally missed it, and that is 100% my fault. Convention. Councilman Bedney. Um, planning uh, recommended approval, and to re refer to the planning com uh, committee, 743 against, and FYI, uh, a motion to defer uh, fail. Uh, five, four, seven against. Okay, Council Lady Hurt. Thank you, Vice Mayor. The Conventions and Tourism Committee voted to um, re refer to the committees for in favor, zero against, and one uh, not voting. Thank you. Councilman Sledge. Thank you, my Vice Mayor. So, so, first of all, my motion is going to be a motion for approval, but to re refer to all committees on third read. So, I want to make sure that. That's the motion that's placed out there. Um, and then the other thing I want to make clear to every member is, and I will say this at the end too, I appreciate your consideration of the night, and I do not hold your vote tonight to third reading. I look at this as an independent vote, so please know that I'm asking for us to continue this conversation tonight. Under no circumstances do I view that as a reflection of our third and final vote. So with that said, I'd like to just go through the um, ordinance real quick. So two things. This is the bill that on third and final reading requires 27 votes. 27 on the ticket tax uh, because of state law, 27 um, regarding the demolition because of the charter. So what, what does that mean? So the ticket tax that's a pr uh, proposed right now is a percentage of the ticket sale that goes toward the maintenance. And I think Councilman Mendez had a good description of what that maintenance is and budget and finance, um, what that goes to, and it doesn't go to anything else. That revenue stream stays within that, but I think he said something that was like day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year maintenance, if that's accurate. Um, so that's what the ticket tax is. The demolition part pertains to really everything we're talking about regarding this entire project, the stadium, the fairgrounds improvement plan. 
um, because the demolition refers to buildings um, in part that are being used for flea market and expo facilities, which would be then new flea market and expo facilities on the northern port of the portion of the property um, that is currently vacant, it's currently empty. Obviously, that is tied to other pieces of legislation that we're discussing, including the general obligation bonds, um, pretty much all kind of wrapped up. So that's why I'm, I have been very thankful to members and committees um, for allowing this to come to a vote on second tonight, because what I'm trying to do is get us to a point where we're having the very comprehensive conversation um, about everything going on at the fairgrounds, including the stadium, including the proposed improvements, including the mixed-use development. Uh, so all that to say, when we talk about the demo vote here tonight, obviously, you know, that, that is not a 27 vote margin tonight. That's on third reading. All I'm requesting from members on this bill and on the subsequent bill is that we're able to, to kind of keep everything on the same schedule so that we're having those comprehensive conversations. And I will fully acknowledge here, as I did, I think, in other committees, that you know, we have that public hearing on Monday, and you know, ostensibly it is on the 10 acres, the mixed use development, because that is a rezoning bill that calls for the public hearing. I think we are all very cognizant that Monday night, public is going to be speaking toward this entire project, and I think that's entirely appropriate. Um, so what I would like to request is, uh, is that we move passage, like I said, on second reading here tonight with a re-referral to all committees on third reading. Thank you. Council Lady Mina Johnson. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Uh, I was the one at the committee uh, suggested to defer this bill because uh, on Monday, uh, the 27th, we will be discussing uh, SP zoning pertaining to uh, the area we are asked to demolish. However, and I do appreciate uh, Council Member Sledge, the commitment to bring all the committee. To me, the reason I you know, I think it's, I feel kind of inappropriate for us to even discuss for the second reading because those people either for or against, they are offered the opportunity to speak in front of us. And before we can hear them, we are uh, deciding uh, either move this bill forward or not uh, move forward. So I am really, really uncomfortable avoiding yes or no, one way or the other. But uh, so since we cannot defer this bill to a special meeting on Monday, uh, I will be voting, I will not be, I will be abstaining to respect to each side. So they will have a robust conversation on Monday. And so. That's, I just wanted to let uh, my uh, district member, you know, constituent know, so that's where I am. So it, it does not mean uh, I will be committing one way or the other at the third reading, but with respect to both owner's team and respect to uh, concerned people in my district, I will be voting this bill and next bill abstaining, but I am all ears on next Monday. Thank you. Yes, Lady Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. One, one quick question. Is this bill amendable on third reading? That's probably a Mr. Jamison question. Is this bill amendable on third reading? I'm sorry, the uh, 1289. Um, I do not believe it qualifies under any of the categories of uh, Rule 15. Okay. It's not a zoning bill or tax bill. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to clarify that. And then second, I, I would just I appreciate uh, Council Member Johnson's concern that that people feel heard, but I do I do feel like the the point that's been made that we're simply moving this forward for the real vote on on third vote, and we are re referring to all committees uh, again for further robust discussion. So I believe it is um, acceptable to continue it to move forward and to give people a full hearing. So I'm going to support it on second reading. Thank you, Council Lady Henderson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Council Lady Allen uh, asked uh, my question, but I would like to build on that, since these bills, uh, 1289 and 1291, are not amendable on third, um, with all due respect to the, the process and the dialogue that will be ongoing, then if we're re-referring them to committee, but we can't actually amend them, then what's the point? So I would say that these bills 
with the SP conversation not happening to Monday are the cart before the horse. And in the spirit that uh, Councilman Sledge was speaking to earlier, which I appreciate, um, I would encourage this body uh, to defer these two bills. Um, and then I guess Mr. Jameson, I had a question. Has the SP bill actually been filed and gone before Planning Commission? What is under discussion on Monday, the it actual? Has, it has gone to the Planning Commission. It has been filed um, and is set for the hearing on the 27th. The 27th Seven. or the 24th? 7th. 27th, yeah. thank you. So I guess um, I would ask Councilman Sledge and others uh, in, in the spirit to which we were speaking and Council Lady Johnson as well, that if these are not amendable on third, the re-referral is somewhat meaningless. So um, I would ask that we uh, consider deferring these. Councilman Sledge. Oh, thank you, and I, and I totally understand the spirit which Councilor Henderson is speaking with. So, my thought on re-referring to all committees. One, I, it is in part, I think, because there have been good questions that have asked, been asked in committees, um, and some questions that, quite frankly, I think do need some further clarification or some answers. Um, I think it's fair to have those discussions, obviously, both on the floor, but also in committees, and I want to be able for that conversation to occur in all of the, uh, of the you know, issues that are addressed within those separate committees, especially because I, I would certainly hope and I, and I expect that we'll be probably talking about those in a context of you know, an extra governmental um, potential agreement. And so I, I wanna make sure that that conversation is being had in that context as well as the context that we've been having this week. I do also wanna make clear to, to members, um, if there are amendments where you know, we as a body feel like that it is important to put on and it's something that is uh, friendly probably is too strong of a word, but it's something that is beneficial and are good ideas. I certainly am not going to object to that, and I don't think that other members of the body would. Um, so I just want to make sure that folks know that I'm very open to improvements on this bill um, and, the, and the next bill. And uh, my purpose in re referring to committees really is for us to continue to have a robust conversation among members and to get the information that everyone needs. Councilman Bednick. At the last meeting, uh, I asked you all if you wanted to have a community meeting about the TOD, and 20 of you voted to have a meeting where you couldn't make any amendments to anything. So I think you all want to have meetings, uh, even if you may not be able to change things, so you can ask questions and know if you want to want to vote for or against a legislation. So I think there is always a benefit to have a meeting even if you don't get to amend the legislation. However, like the councilman said, that uh, we can still do it if people agree to suspend the rules. Uh, I am going to say that I'm going to support this on second reading, um, but I won't vote for it on third reading if that uh, CBA is not what it needs to be. And the reason is, is I've been in the council now for about seven years, and I have tried with many of of you here to advance some of these causes of having good local jobs, safe jobs, permanent jobs. We try to build affordable housing so our police officers, our teachers, our employees can stay in the city. We didn't give them a raise recently, so many of you can stay in their jobs here in Nashville. So at least we should make sure that we give them a place to live. So if we don't have this CBA, then I'm just not going to vote for it, uh, but we I'm basically talking to the people that are the developers here. I hope that they will hear me loud and clear that that is an absolute need for me and many other people that are here today. So I'm going to vote for this today, but I expect to see the CBA taken care of before soon, or this is just going to go downhill. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jameson. Can I correct myself? I've been in consultation with legal director Cooper. So the, the bill has two provisions with respect uh, the demolition approval and it does impose the privilege tax and rule 15 allows amendments on tax ordinances granted that's typically applied to our operating budget um, and tax levy but it does broadly state tax ordinances so I think we agree that at least with respect to the second half of the bill that could be amended on third my apologies 
Councilman Glover. Well, I think that, well, I'm obviously going to vote the way everybody knows I'm going to vote on this one, but um, the, the, the thing that concerned me is I didn't, but if it can be amendable and uh, that option's there, then, you know, uh, but um, I still get nervous when we when we do these things and then all of a sudden we get down to the 11th hour and we got to do it right now. We got to pass it right now. And so, um, you know, with that, vote your conscience. Thank you. Councilman Shulman. Thank you, Madam President. We were just discussing uh, the amendability of this thing on third. And uh, maybe if Mr. Jameson doesn't mind repeating it, because the, it sounds like part of it is amendable, but some of it's not. So just could you clarify again? Sure. The, the bill essentially does two things, approves the demolition of the certain buildings and structures, but also imposes a privilege tax. Rule 15, which sets out the different categories of bills that are amendable on third, talks about zoning bills, uh, revenue service charge bills, and then refers to tax ordinances. That's generally be, been construed as our tax levy as part of the operating budget, but it does just broadly say tax ordinances, and I think you could reasonably construe 1289, the second part, the privilege tax on tickets, as being a tax ordinance. So amendments at least just to that part would, I think, be submittable on third reading, not to the demolition portion, but to the, the ticket tax. Okay, so even though, even even though it's in one bill, you can only amend part of the bill on third. I think that honors the spirit of Rule 15. Okay. Thank you. And I really do want to honor the spirit of Rule 15. Thank you. <laughs> Council Lady Mina Johnson. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, uh, Vice Mayor. I do appreciate uh, Council Lady uh, uh, Buckley and uh, Council Lady Henderson's question. So it uh, confirms now uh, only the portion of the bill is amendable. So we are uh, not be able to amend which part of the building to demolish or even not to demolish. So it's a very, gives me very different meaning about, uh, you know, re referral to the committee. It just, bring it back to the committee, just talk about it, uh, talk about what? So, it, to me, it's a really, really disrespect for the citizens of the Davidson County who are vested in sitting over here and wanting to express what need to happen at the you know, fairgrounds. They are coming uh, next Monday. So we are deciding, yes, uh, you can come, but we already decided to which portion of the building are we going to demolish. And then uh, third reading, we won't be able to change it if there is any meaningful compromise. So for that reason, I do support a deferral motion made by Council Lady uh, Henderson. You didn't defer, but you didn't move to defer. I didn't think so. Councilman Anthony Davis. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'll just quickly say, I think <laughs> I wanted to uh, call for it, but I'm not going to. Uh, I will just quickly say, I think we <laughs> solved that amending thing and, and there's no need to defer. So if anyone does make that motion, I hope we can defeat it. And just a quick pile on, I know it's been said, but uh, I also just want to say that we need the CBA. I think we can get the excitement back for supporting this. I'm going to support it here on second as well, but I think, um, those of us that are have been supporters this entire time really want to get the excitement back for soccer and the stadium, <clears throat> and we need to see the commitment to affordable housing and a living wage. Thank you. Thank you. Council Lady Hart. Thank you, Vice Chair, uh, Vice Mayor. My concern is, is that this, the same reason that people are talking about the CBA I don't want to move it forward because we don't have a CBA. I don't trust that the promises made are going to be kept. I want some tangible evidence that that is going to take place in order for me to uh, vote for and support this. And, and, you know, I have problems with the language. Certain buildings and structures necessary for the construction. 
that could be any. I mean, it's one thing now, and it could be another thing later. And in the generality that we are approving, it just seems to me it's not a specific enough to say so. So I was told that if we um, do not pass this tonight, then the talk of the CBA will be off the table. Mr. Jameson, can you explain that uh, and give more information in regards to that, please? Well, this, as uh, Councilman Sledge noted on this legislation on third reading, it would require uh, 27 votes. Uh, but if it does not get a majority of those voting tonight, um, then it fails and the demolition portion would have failed. It can, it can die on second, in other words. How does that relate to the CBA? Well, I assume with the failure of the demolition, which is required under the charter to eventually pass by 27, if that dies tonight, then the, the, there's no CBA agreement to uh, be concerned about because the entire proposal is essentially over. So that means that means that uh, there will be no building of a soccer stadium. If there's no demolition of the fairgrounds and no uh, privilege tax on the ticket tax, that's what that would mean. Correct. Thank you, Councilman Pardue. Call for question. There's a motion to call for the question. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Yes, ma'am. You were next in the queue. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Motion passes. We're on the bill. Yes. 27 votes. So why is the second reading only 21 votes as opposed to the requirement of the passage with 27 votes. Right. The 27 applies to the third and final reading. Uh, the second reading of any ordinance doesn't actually even need 21. It just needs a majority of those present and voting. Okay, Madam Clerk, go ahead and open the machines, please. We're going to do roll call vote. Machine vote, rather. This needs a majority vote. Madam Clerk, you can close the machines. Tally the vote. 24 in favor, 7 against, 8 abstentions. Motion passes. We are now on BL 2018-1291. Sponsors Sledge, Vercher, and Bednay. Declares property surplus and approves a ground lease between the Board of Fair Commissioners and Nashville Soccer Holdings Development, LLC, for the construction of a development at the Fairgrounds, Nashville. Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Committee reports, please. Council Lady Vercher. Thank you for allowing me be, to be in the queue this time, Madam President. You're welcome. Um, budget and Finance recommended approval for the Amendment 1240 against. And um, uh, as amended, Budget and Finance recommended disapproval uh, 6 against 5 4. Councilman Swope. Coach Fairs, Farmers Market, recommended approval, 5-4, 0 against, 2 non-voting. Councilman Bednay. I'm sorry, Councilmember Potts was uh, distracting me. So uh, the, the committee, the planning committee, was delighted to review this uh, legislation and its amendment and recommended approval of the amendment 10 for 2 against and to approve, recommend the approval as amended 8-4 uh, and re-refer to the planning committee, 8-4 for, for against. And there was also a motion to do a deferral and that failed 4-4-8 for, for, for against. Thank you. Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. So again, my motion will be to approve on second and then re-refer to all committees. Um, 
So again, I, I will reiterate to council members, I would appreciate your support on this. I consider this vote, again, separate from all other votes. I do not consider it influenced onto third and final reading. Um, so this, this uh, ordinance basically would, it is about the ground lease. I do need to move an amendment that was approved by the fair board. So I'm gonna make a motion to uh, move amendment one. Councilman Kendall, are you speaking on the amendment or are you speaking on the bill? On the bill? Okay. Councilman O'Connell, are you speaking on the bill? Okay. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of the amendment one? Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. You're on your bill as amended. Okay, so the bill as amended now um, refers obviously to the ground lease on the various portions of the property that we've been discussing this evening. I will note that as amended now, uh, the fair board um, took a vote uh, last week. They had further negotiations with the team regarding um, parking revenues and sort of lease payments. So the outcome of that was that they increased the lease payments over the life of the lease to a total, um, they increased it by 16.8 million, meaning the total payments over the life of the lease are somewhere around $23 million. Um, so it, thanks to the good work of the fair board, there is an improved term um, uh, regarding this ground lease. So again, um, it does pertain to everything else we've been discussing regarding the property. I won't get too far into that. Uh, that is again, for the reason for re, uh, referral to all committees, it is of course, heavily influenced by the conversation we're gonna have Monday night and the anticipation of the CBA that we have discussed. So with that, I would then move approval with all, with a referral, re-referral to all committees on third. Thank you. Councilman Kendall. Thank you. This is a question I guess I've got from Mr. Jameson. On this uh, ground lease agreement, uh, well, well, my question is, the CBA that we keep talking about, the Community Benefits Agreement, who is that between? Uh, that is not a Metro uh, agreement to which Metro is a party. It's a third party agreement between the team and uh, Stand Up. So if, if the agreement is not, we don't have any standing to challenge anything if the agreement is not upheld? If Metro is not a party, we could not litigate any breach of the agreement, correct? How can we get in the ball game? The problem is that uh, community benefit agreements, while technically legal under state law for Metro in, to engage in, the state has um, uh, on multiple times restricted the specific items we would like to see within them. Uh, we had a, a charter amendment that was overturned on the ability to have certain guarantees with respect to minority participation. Uh, wage rate guarantees, illegal under state law and other requirements. So the solution has been from the Metro perspective to have a third party agreement between private parties. It's binding as between those two parties and any aggrieved party could sue the other for a breach of that contract, but Metro does not have state. So, so the two parties in this situation are the LLC and who? Uh, uh, stand, stand Up Nashville, I believe, is the, is okay. the other private party and it's my understanding is it's not for want of metro not wanting to be a participant it's just a matter of what is allowed under state law so stand up nashville if the agreement is not complied with they have the uh, right to go to court or whatever i assume so i haven't seen the final agreement but i assume there are provisions in there for breach and uh okay, i'm not anticipating that anybody a breach but you know i just want to be sure that we have some standing either through somebody else or, or ourselves, and obviously we don't. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask that the people that are standing in the back of the room please find a really comfortable seat on those hard wooden benches. Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I think um, these comments would have been relevant on either one of these bills as, as I think, you know, the sponsor knows this is all uh, kind of moving us in the direction of this question of um, not only will Nashville be an MLS city, but will we pursue uh, that idea by, um, by building a, a new stadium and, and adjacent private development. I think in regard to that, we've heard not just tonight, but I think um, for quite some time now uh, that we 
stand to make an important decision here about the, the very community benefits agreement that Councilman Kendall just referenced. And I think it's important to have some specificity about that. I think for me personally, one of the reasons I'm interested in the specificity has to do a lot with uh, a number of the constituents I represent. We, we've been talking since we were all elected about affordable housing, and that's certainly an important component of this. But one of the reasons it's important is because some of the most affordable housing in Nashville uh, is related to public housing, right? So I have a number of uh, acres of public housing and that I represent in District 19. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, a number of the people that are looking to escape poverty, which is correlated with, uh, it's got a high correlation and high rate in, in District 19 with uh, inability to access great jobs and great wages. And I think w one of the difficulties with how we've done um, you know, public entertainment facilities, specifically with regard to sports in Nashville, is uh, one of the, diff the, the unseen pieces of that is for everybody who goes to any of our current uh, facilities, the pieces that you don't see are frequently the, what happens with custodians and service employees, and those tend to be uh, you know, arranged through contract with temp employees, and this is where I think this community benefits agreement stands to be potentially transformative to Nashville. And for this body, which, uh, you know, disappointingly and frustratingly through a difficult budget cycle stepped away from a three-year pay plan, this is our opportunity to set a wage floor to really honor uh, the folks that are taking care of these facilities when no one else is looking, uh, and to deliver something truly transformative in the way we do public projects in Nashville. I think that's why there are uh, very explicitly a lot of eyes on how this deal plays out. So it's one of the things that I'm paying most careful attention to. I'm certainly taking uh, Councilman Sledge's advice here on advancing the, the conversation to second reading, but I think th these are the reasons why uh, this conversation uh, about the community benefits agreement, even though it is external to the, the deliberations of this body, makes so much of a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Cooper. Thank you, Madam President. Um, just very briefly, the language itself tells you it is wrong. It is not surplus if 1.6 million people are using it. This is the exact site, the current fairgrounds. It is not surplus if somebody is using it just because somebody else wants it more. You've got 1.6 million people. If every seat in the stadium were filled up, that would only be five or 600,000 people. You can't take something from the many and give it to the fewer. And the reason the surplusing is necessary is to make a bad stadium location less bad. The stadium should be closer to downtown, and you are, to give this incentive, to give the current fairgrounds, because you're ratifying a lo stadium location, that there is no evidence whatsoever, no study, analysis, or report, any justification for locating it at the fairgrounds. It's simply there because it was in the mayor's power to give that's not something you should ratify. Council Lady Mina Johnson. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Uh, this bill uh, is, if you really think about it, you know, uh, again, next Monday, we will be discussing uh, SP and this exact portion of the 10 acre, that this dot, that's where we will be discussing. So if that bill does not advance, there will be no ground lease. And I just don't understand why are we keep putting the cart before the horse and so rushing into this process. This, if, you know, this zone change is not passed, there will be no ground lease. And so why are we even considering this? So for that reason, I think it's really procedurally wrong. So right thing will be to defy it. And I'm not discounting you know, affordable housing. I'm not discounting a community benefit agreement. I do appreciate all the work. However, procedurally, processfully, you know, this process advancing to second reading for the portion of the dot we may were, you know, still using is just utterly wrong. So I won't be able to support this one. Councilman Mendez. Thanks. I just wanted to briefly make the point that the 
um, additional rent that's added from years 31 to 99 has a present value of only about a million dollars to Metro. Um, so even after about 99 years worth of um, lease, uh, the value to Metro today is about four million total for the full 99 years. And uh, that's, that's less than, um, uh, dramatically less than the appraised value um, that we've seen. And um, I know there's been talk about it's, you know, uh, the gross amount of payments over 99 years is 22 million, but what it's worth to us today is only about four. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Lady Gilmore. Um, I think I stand with uh, Freddie and others in my support of the CBA. We do know it's external, but I definitely think it's an opportunity uh, when we talk about uh, responsible contractors providing uh, strong job opportunities, wages, protections. And so, you know, I probably will abstain, if not vote no, until we get more, uh, a clear, more definition and more support. And I think that things are going better, but all of it's tied to it. And we can't uh, do CBAs, even though other cities do them across the United States, we can't do them as a city. But that is something that I definitely support. I support workers, I support employment, I support job opportunities. So I do think that this is tied to this legislation that we keep on moving forward, all uh, three pieces separately, and that we really need to think about our employees and our workers and the, the, the citizens of Nashville, the residents of Nashville, and just making sure that we give them a hand up, especially uh, in this shortfall that we just had and we could not even pay our own employees. And if nothing else, we can provide affordable housing. This is our opportunity because it's in the Community Benefits Agreement. We can offer, uh, offer jobs. This is in the com Community Be Benefits Agreement. We can also offer protections to our workers. And there's even talk of child care, which will lift a lot of people out of poverty if given the opportunity. So for the listening audience, that's what the Community Benefits Agreement does. And so we really support Stand Up Nashville. I know that I do. I want to see a change for all, all the residents of Nashville and not just for some. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Withers. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Um, Council Member uh, Mina Johnson raises a, a lot of really good points. I just want to remind everyone that from the outset, this was a, a suite of legislation that was presented. It was timed in such a manner that we would discuss all of these as a package um, after the public hearing. And so that, that sort of is an expectation that was set from the beginning with uh, this suite of legislation that was all brought together. So uh, if Council Member um, uh, Mina Johnson uh, or other council members, we will all be looking at, at all of these all together after the public hearing. Uh, this approving this on second reading tonight does not make it in effect, uh, unlike some other legislation. Um, it also does not tie us to vote for it on third reading. Um, however, uh, disapproving this legislation today will kill the whole package potentially. So just want folks to look at that uh, carefully when they vote. I, Personally, I'm very strongly committed to the work of the community benefits agreement discussions. I want to see those discussions move forward, and for that reason, I will be voting in favor of this on second reading today. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Glover. Call the question. There's been a motion to call the question from Councilman Glover. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. So we are now on the bill. Madam Clerk, if you would please open the machines. Madam Clerk, you can close the machines and tally the vote, please. 24 in favor, nine against, six abstentions. Thank you. We are now on BL 2018-1292, Councilman Sledge amends the Metro Code regarding the Public Records Commission membership and the provision of secretarial duties. Councilmember Sledge. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Committee reports, please.
or Madam Speaker Pro Tem Committee reports, please. Thank you. Council Member, hold on. Mm -hmm. Council Member Withers. This is 1292. I beg your pardon, let me find my committee that is reports. Okay. I was We've in, been focused. I was in the personnel, I was in the Planning, Zoning, and Historical Committee and was not able to attend my own committee that I chair. Um, the Personnel, uh, Public Information, Human Relations, and Housing Committee did meet this afternoon, and they uh, did have a quorum, and the committee uh, considered Bill 2018-1292 recommended approval uh, for and favor, zero against. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilmember Haywood. This is the uh, rules com report on 1292. Uh, yes, we certainly did entertain this bill and we voted 7-4 and zero against. Thank you. Councilmember Sledge. Thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. There's a housekeeping amendment I need to move, so I'll make that motion. Okay, is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. We are voting on the amendment. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Councilmember Sledge, you're on your Bill as amended. Thanks. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve with a very brief comment. Okay, you're recognized. Uh, this is purely a housekeeping bill. It's getting us back in line with the committee. Um, when we kind of came in line with a new state law regarding public records, we forgot to change a number uh, of how many members are on the committee, and that's what this does. So I would move approval. Thank you. Seeing no one in the queue, all those in favor? Any opposed? Bill passes. Next is BL 2018-1293. Council Member Gilmore. This amends the Metro Code to impose a privileged tax on the sale of tickets to events at the new Major League Stadium. Councilmember Gilmore. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. Committee reports, please. Thank you, Councilmember Vercher. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Budget and Finance recommended a one meeting deferral, 12 4 0 against. Thank you. Councilmember Swope. Codes, Fairs, Farmers Market. Uh, voted to defer one meeting, 740 against. Thank you. Council Member Sharon Hurt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, conventions, Tourism, and Public Entertainment Facilities voted to defer one meeting, 54 and 0 against. Thank you. Council Member Gilmore. I move to defer one meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor, one meeting deferral. Yep. Any opposed? Bill is deferred. Next is BL 2018-1294. Councilmember O'Connell. This amends the Metro Code regarding excessive noise. Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, request committee reports, please. Thank you. Councilmember Swope. Coast Fairs Farmers Market voted to defer two meetings per the sponsor's request, 740 against. Thank you. Councilmember Roberts. Thank you. Uh, public safety, beer, and regulated beverages voted four in favor, zero against, to defer two meetings per the sponsor. Thank you. Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to move to defer for two meetings with a brief explanation. All right. You're recognized. Thank you. Uh, this uh, bill was filed somewhat in response to um, now that we have a, a growing residential community in Midtown. Uh, after watching the explosion of growth in downtown um, and, and sort of looking at where, where we've been countywide with uh, enforce, enforcement of noise um, via the Metro Code of Laws as it exists. I turned you off. I'm sorry. You're back. <laughs> I didn't think I had reached time. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. And uh, we, we basically discovered a policy donut hole in Midtown where um, in the downtown code, while there are fewer... Uh, provisions for regulating noise than elsewhere in the county, uh, there is at least this idea of a noise mitigation plan that typically gets attached to projects uh, at the time of construction. That is absent in Midtown and the way that uh, Metro Codes is, is construing uh, what is in the Metro Code of Laws based on the phrase residential zoning is actually fairly consistent with where we've been with uh, short-term rentals. So I had constituents calling uh, Metro Police only to discover that they you know, could, couldn't really do much about uh, some of the noise issues that we, th we had all understood might be covered under the Metro Code of Laws. We're gonna take a, 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 an opportunity here, uh, similar to what we did with um, 
the dockless mobility issue and uh, put together a stakeholders meeting and see if there is an opportunity to amend here. But the basic concept is to see if we can carve out uh, that donut hole and this, this might very well anticipate a larger conversation about um, noise of all kinds in Nashville from construction to live and amplified music and, and kind of hours and appropriate volumes and those kinds of things. But uh, starting that with this bill, thank you. Great, thank you. Councilmember Bednay, do you want to speak on this? Yeah, I'd like to kiss Councilmember O'Connell. I mean, this is such an important thing. It's one of the things that, that we get more complaints. Many of us that live in areas where there is so much growth, people are just fed up that at 5 in the morning there is a crew with a nail uh, thingy on the roof uh, making this very loud noise at the time where they are trying to... Uh, and I know this is just downtown, but we need to look at an overhaul, I think, of noise... Uh, generating construction and other things that happen citywide. This is such a big problem because uh, on one hand we are asking codes to do it, but we are not giving them the funding or the tools to do it. The police cannot do it either because they are also strapped. I mean, it, it's, it's a big problem. And for many people, quality of life, it's a big deal. I mean, they just, they just pay their taxes, they work really hard, they want to get home, and they want to go to sleep. They don't want to hear all this noise coming next door. And so, thank you, council member. I'll, I'll give you a kiss later. <laughs> and I uh, appreciate you all uh, really taking this seriously. Thanks. Madam thank President, you. I'd like to refer councilman to uh, the recent uh, policies we've passed on sexual harassment. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that up later. Thank all you. All right, thank you. Anything else you'd like to say? No, that, that's, that's got my comment. Okay. So we have a motion for two meeting deferral. All those in favor? Wait, wait. Point of, point of order, I believe. Thank you. Council member Murphy, I apologize. I couldn't help but um, take a, a point of, I guess, personal privilege, but a reminder for all of y'all that we have passed legislation that sites in um, residential areas should have signs in front of them. So if they are doing construction, if they have a permit, unless it is like myself pulling out um, my floorboards, um, I should have a sign out front that says, the hours of construction allowed, the noise ordinance, it should have a phone number for codes, it should have a phone number for the contractor. And I am asking and begging every single one of you that it is, it's, it's on us and on our neighbors that if, a, if there's a construction site that does not have this sign, because I've seen few on, in my district, I've spent a lot of time in, in Councilman Weathers district this, this summer and they've got different varieties we need to be turning them into codes because codes had told me that they would not continue inspecting those properties if they don't have the signs. But as we all know, I'm seeing a lot of construction without that sign. And so I need y'all to help us enforce the law that we created earlier this year. Contractors need to put those signs out and empower our constituents to help us with this. So thank, thank you. you for my soapbox. Thank you. Councilman O'Connell. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I think uh, in, in reflecting upon Council Lady Murphy's remarks, um, I have actual photographic evidence of one such sign in my district, and I'm appreciative of that. I will note that I, in a bounty for don't block my walk uh, signs, I did only have one uh, submitted proof of evidence that that is being followed to, so we do have some work to do on that front. Um, however, I would like to renew my motion to defer for two meetings. Thank two meetings. you. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bills deferred two meetings. Next is BL 2018-1295, sponsor O'Connell. Amends the Metro Code to add Symphony Place to the designated rights of way upon which street vendors shall not be permitted to operate within the downtown code and CF districts. Councilmember O'Connell. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I'd like to request committee reports here, thank please. Thank you. Councilmember Elrod. 1295. Public Works recommend approval as substituted. Six in favor, zero against. Thank you. Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I do, uh, I guess I'd need to move the substitute. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on the substitute? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. You're on your bill as substituted. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to move approval of the brief explanation. You're recognized. Thank you. And uh, this one is something that we had been in discussion with. We, you know, as, as the caption uh, summarizes here, we ordinarily do permit uh, street vendors um, to operate uh, within DTC and CF districts. However, there are a few specific areas that, you know, for instance, Lower Broadway, uh, where I think in terms of recognizing 
uh, that as, as a combined commercial and historic district, um, it was given special consideration uh, based on some recent safety concerns and, and I think some similar concerns about sort of the, the character of the area and how it was specifically designed for a purpose, even though it is a public place. Uh, I had been in conversation with the symphony about um, extending this protection uh, to that area and then actually got a request from police to go ahead and extend it uh, all the way along Symphony Place to the pedestrian bridge. I think I think this is an absolutely reasonable request given, um, again, you know, downtown is a large area. The, the area within downtown code and core frame are large areas. These vendors have quite a footprint to operate within, and I, I think um, taking into consideration the concerns expressed by both Symphony and police, this, this should, get, again, I think improve overall safety and uh, visitor experience for, for that portion of downtown. Thank you, I'd like to move approval. Thank you, we have a bit of discussion. Council Member Van Rees. Um, yes, uh, I, I support this, but I, I would like to ask the sponsor to uh, refer this to on third reading over to the uh, Tourism uh, and uh, Public Facilities Committee as well for input. Uh, for some reason that we, that was left off and all the other street vendor um, discussions were including on that committee. So um, if you would be so kind as to make sure that on that third reading that uh, our committee gets to hear it, I'd love that. Thank you. And Madam President, I'm happy to amend my motion to uh, uh, move approval with a uh, referral to Convention Tourism and Public Entertainment Facilities on third. Thank you. Duly noted. Council Member Bednick. Sorry, Council Member Scott Davis is distracting me. Right. I hope he is not stealing my kiss. <laughs> no, no, you, you, I'll give it to you later. I, I was watching. Uh, and so, uh, ma'am, uh, I, I voted against this at the committee, uh, but I'm going to support it here. But I, I just want to caution us into uh, not being over zealous, zealous with uh, small vendors and street vendors, which many times are like uh, uh, people that are uh, trying to make a living uh, in a decent way, and uh, we don't want to uh, overreact in trying to put restrictions to them. I mean, we do need to make sure that they're not a nuisance, but in some cities, uh, we have seen, uh, like in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, they have gone after uh, like taco vendors and people that, that work on the streets and that had uh, uh, been done uh, excessively. So I, I just wanted us to, although I'm going to support this, to be cautioned not to go down that road uh, and start limiting this uh, no matter what. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you, Madam oh, President. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, sorry. We have one more speaker. Uh, Councilmember Dowell. I just want to make the same comment on this. I think we have to be really careful about how we use these special districts to prohibit certain people from being there. I mean, we had this conversation uh, last year about the buskers uh, downtown, and I continue to see that we use um, these restrictions using like DTC and, and CF districts to restrict these, but yet they can go to other parts of the county and operate without any uh, problems. And so uh, I'm not going to support it. Um, um, I think that we need to come up with a better plan for street vendors personally because what I'm seeing is out in our area, I see tons of them, and there's no rules regarding them. But when you come downtown, we have certain restrictions, and I really don't understand uh, how we can set up these special districts to prohibit certain people from uh, selling things in one area and not. I think we need to look globally at this and come up with a better solution for handling buskers, people singing, their, um, people selling things on the street, and so forth. So. I will be voting no. Thank you. Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, taking those uh, concerns very seriously, I think um, with this being really the only such request uh, I've received in uh, three years of service uh, to this area and also recognizing again the special circumstances in which the uh, current facility for the symphony was designed and, and the public space to incorporate it. I, I think in this case, I'm perfectly comfortable moving ahead with this. Although, you know, I, I think on that, on both points, the need to um, maintain an ecosystem in which uh, vendors of all types are able to both seek permits and do business, and then also to think about things on a citywide basis. I mean, there are certainly some things where uh, I would actually contend that the um, 
the downtown environment, including the, the very uh, existence of the downtown code makes downtown particularly unique. Um, there are ways in which some things uh, need to be equitably addressed and globally addressed throughout the city. I think in this case, this particular instance is so minor, it updates uh, an existing portion of the Metro Code, and I encourage colleagues to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's been a motion to approve and refer to tourism on third reading. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Bill is passed. Next is BL 2018-1296, sponsors Bircher, Roten, and O'Connell, approves a revocable license agreement between the Metro Board of Parks and Recreation and Glowco LLC for the use of Riverfront Park and Ascend Amphitheater. Councilmember Bircher. Um, oh, committee reports. Council Member Hurt. This is 1296. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. The Convention's Tourism and Public Entertainment Facilities voted five in favor and zero against for approval. Thank you. Council Member Roten. Parks, Library, and Arts voted uh, approval, six in favor, six against. Thank you. Council Member Bircher. Budget and Finance recommended approval 1240 against, and I move for approval. Thank you. We have uh, several speakers in the queue. Council Member Withers. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Just wanted to uh, um, acknowledge on the floor that I appreciate uh, the applicants uh, contacting me in District 6. I definitely hear a lot from constituents about either traffic from events in the greater riverfront area or sometimes also noise. So just appreciate them reaching out to me and uh, letting me know a little bit more about this project. I think it'll be a great addition to the downtown riverfront area and uh, I will be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. Um, even though I'm not the lead on this bill, uh, it is something that will occur in District 19. Um, and I, I will say, uh, you know, having tracked this from the moment that uh, this this particular uh, project kind of reached Metro Parks, I'm pleased that, uh, to Councilman Withers' point, um, the, the group proposing to do this uh, did quite a bit of outreach. And in fact, just this afternoon, I completed a meeting with um, the president of the Urban Residents Association to review it. I think, uh, you know, in terms of making sure that we have maximal use, including programming, looking at the principles of what are in plan to play. Uh, this actually takes a, a public space that, if, since it's been open, has been, frankly, underutilized during the winter and holiday season and will activate it, and I think, uh, offer an amenity not just to urban residents, but uh, potentially to all Nashvilleians. Uh, and I think it also opens a window to revenue collection for Metro Parks, again, in, a, in both a season and a location where that has not been uh, particularly likely or possible. And so I, I encourage colleagues to support this. Thank you. Councilman Roten. Uh, yeah, I need to correct something. I said six in favor, six against. That was a, I just misspoke. It was six in favor, zero against. Thank My you. Apology. Thank you. Councilor Lady Dow. Okay. Council Lady Bircher. Committee reports. Did we not just get committee reports? I move for approval. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1297, seven council members Roten, Bircher, and others authorizes the Metro Department of Water and Sewer Services to enter into an agreement with KJPL Riverwood LLC to fund the operation and maintenance of the public pressure sewer extension for its development at the village of Riverwood. Councilman Roten. Thank you. Committee reports, please. Council Lady Bircher. Thank you, Madam President. Budget and Finance recommended approval 12-4-0 against. Councilman Bednay. Nobody is distracting me now, so it's my fault. The committee recommended approval 10 4 0 against. Councilman Elrod. Public works recommend approval 6 in favor, 0 against. Councilman Hager, this time you do have a report. Having a bargain for 4 0 against. Councilman Roden. Move approval. Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Opposed, motion passes. Bill 2018-1298, council members Virtue, Bedney, and Elrod authorizes the acquisition of right-of-way easements, drainage easements, temporary construction easements, and property rights for use in public projects for purposes of the Brewer Drive sidewalk improvements. Council Lady Virtue. Thank you, Madam President. Committee reports. 
You want to give yours? Budget and finance recommended approval 1240 against. Councilman Bednay. The uh, planning committee recommended approval 1140 against. Councilman Elrod. Public works recommended approval six in favor, zero against. Council Lady Vircher. No, move for approval. Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1299, Council Members Pulley, Bedney, and Elrod abandons existing sanitary sewer main and easements into accept new sanitary sewer main, a sanitary sewer manhole, and easements for property located at 4000 Hillsborough Pike. Councilman Pulley. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Committee reports, please. Councilman Bedney. The committee recommended approval 1140 against. Councilman Elrod. Public works recommend approval six in favor, zero against. Councilman Pulley. With that, I move approval. Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1300, Council Members Murphy, Bedney, and Elrod abandons existing sanitary sewer main and easements for properties located at 211 and 231 Ensworth Place. Council Lady Murphy. Council Lady Murphy. Committee reports. Councilman Bedney. The planning committee had a lengthy uh, debate about this legislation on the merits of, uh, of this issue of sanitary sewer mains. And uh, after that uh, conversation, we uh, listening to the uh, council member, we decided that it was an appropriate use and we recommended approval 1140 against. Councilman Elrod. Despite the sponsor, re public works record approval six in favor, zero against. Council Lady Murphy. With all the thoughtful input from the committees that I really, truly appreciate, as does the school, I would like to move for approval. Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1301, Council Members Withers, Bedney, and Elrod abandons existing sanitary sewer main and easement to accept new sanitary sewer mains, sanitary sewer manholes, fire hydrants, and easements for six properties located on South 6th Street. Councilman Withers. Thank you, Madam President. Could I get committee reports, please? Councilman Bedney. The committee recommended approval 1140 against. Councilman Elrod. But works recommend approval six in favor, zero against. Councilman Withers. Thank you. I would like to request approval. Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1302, sponsors Kendall Bedney and Elrod, authorizes Metro government to remove existing clay sanitary sewer mains and sanitary sewer manholes and to replace with new sanitary sewer mains and sewer sanitary sewer manholes within the existing public utility easement for property located at 2300 Patterson Street. Councilman Kendall. I'll be taking this one. Councilman Bedney. So I had a hard time reading this at the committee as well. I feel much better. Uh, the, uh, I need committee reports, and I'm going to report that the planning committee recommended approval 1140 against. Councilman Bedney. Uh, say Councilman Elrod, I'm sorry. Because of the sponsor, Public Works recommend approval six in favor, zero against. Councilman Bedney. Uh, I move to approve. Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1303, Councilman Withers, Bedney, and Elrod abandons a portion of alley number 451 right-of-way and easement. Councilman Withers. Thank you, Madam President. Could I get committee reports, please? Sure. Councilman Bedney. Yes, the committee recommended approval, 11-4-0 uh, against. Councilman Elrod, would you mind giving a report? Public Works recommended approval, six in favor, zero against. Councilman Hager, your turn. We're going to drive and approve 440 against. Councilman Withers. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to uh, move approval. Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. We're on BL 2018 1304. Council members O'Connell, Bedney, and Elrod. Abandoned a portion of Magazine Street right of way. Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to re uh, request committee reports, please. Councilman Bedney. The committee recommended approval, 11-4-0 against. Councilman Elrod. For the Vice Chair of Public Works, public work, the committee recommended approval, six in favor, zero against. Councilman Hager. Bavigan Park and approved, 4-4-0 four, four, against. Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to move approval, please. Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. We are now on bills on third reading. BL 2016 219, Council Members Bedney, Johnson, and others cancel 7.84 acres of the Forest View Park unplanned 
Forest View Park planned unit development and by changing from R10 to RS10, zoning for property located at Forest View Drive. This has been disapproved by the Planning Commission. It will need 27 votes. Councilman Bedney. Uh, contrary to what some people think, this is something I, it's, it's Council Lady Karen Johnson's legislation. I just allow her to uh, support her on this request, but it's, it's really hers. Council Lady Johnson, the floor is yours. I believe, um Council Attorney Jamison, that all committee reports are in? Correct. Okay. Um, I would like to move to withdraw with a brief explanation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, colleagues, uh, I am withdrawing, surprisingly, uh, this bill uh, because, one, I won't, I, the threshold is high to get 27 votes. And so I had to meet with the people in my community um, we talked um, extensively um, about why this should not move forward past my time in the council. Um, we also, I also talked with the owner of this property, and we've all come to an agreement. And what that agreement is, the property has been placed back on the market. Um, the broker that's handling the property um, is going to work with myself and the community. And although uh, Council at Large Mendez <laughs> uh, would be the point person in terms of communication with people in my area, uh, there is an understanding from the community meeting that I will still be heavily involved. And that is with making sure uh, that the broker that has this property will communicate with the uh, people in District 29. They have agreed that an old PUD that is 30 years old um, is not appropriate to develop to. Uh, one of the snafus that happened with the Planning Commission that resulted in the disapproval, hopefully everyone here will learn from the, the issue that happened with my situation because you don't want to um, end up with an old PUD where you have a development developed on a 30-year back plan, if that makes sense, um, on something that was approved 30 years ago. And why that's important is because with the owner and with the broker, we had to explain to them that our concerns in the community was about safety. Um, not just the clustering of three low-income apartments, uh, developments in one block, but the fact that a 30-year-old PUD would have given that developer an opportunity to uh, build the streets uh, without any street lighting. They would not be required to build public streets to our current code, and all of those things affect safety. And so I hope um, that you all are more aware based on this situation and how it affects um, communities, um, and I appreciate all of the council members that signed on uh, to support this bill. We had overwhelming support, and then you were lobbied heavily uh, by the Chamber of Commerce and others. And I pray that after I leave this council that you all hold the Chamber of Commerce um, accountable to ensuring that pocketed poverty does not exist in any area of our city. Uh, they should not be standing up for that anymore. So I hope that this is an example for everyone. I appreciate all of my Southeast colleagues for standing firm. My constituents wanted uh, Councilman at Large Bob Mendez to know that they really, really appreciated him um, showing such great leadership when this issue first um, hit the Metro Council. And so with that, um, I want to renew my motion to withdraw. Council Lady Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I support your motion to withdraw. I know this has been a long journey on this particular piece of property, but also just to point out to all council members that uh, there is a, a rule on the books that says that if a PUD is older than four years old, the council member has a 
right to review it um, and to declare it inactive. And so it's probably worth all of our time to go back and look at the PUDs in our district and make sure there aren't any languishing there that need to be reviewed. Thank you. Thank you. There's been a motion to withdraw. Properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? I'm sorry, did I hear a no? Okay, I have a hearing loss for that one. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Second substitute bill, BL 2016 414, Councilman Scott Davis, changes 5.82 acres from R6 to SB zoning for various properties along Elvira Avenue, Manor Avenue, and Keeling Avenue to permit a maximum of 221 residential units. Councilman Scott Davis. Thank you. I'd like to defer for one meeting with a brief explanation. Floor is yours. We're going to be moving a substitute. Uh, we're very close to good community support. And basically, we're going to be cutting the unit count by at maybe more, but at least by 65%. So we're looking at between 70 to probably 50 units. Um, so I'd like to defer this and like to move the substitute later on. Council Lady Van Rees. Um, yes, I, I believe this is automatically deferred. Is that correct, Mr. Jameson? Okay. Um, I, I want to make sure that uh, any future community meetings uh, uh, also uh, are invited by District 8. Uh, so I wanted to uh, make sure that the folks from Maynard uh, get a chance to be able to hear uh, this new plan. Thank you very much. Councilman Bedney, we need to get a committee report, please. It was deferred to 9418 per rule number 23. Thank you. There is a motion to defer one meeting. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1139, Councilmember Syracuse approves the Donaldson Transit-Oriented Redevelopment Plan. Councilman Syracuse. Thank you, Madam President. Well, the good news here is I don't have anything new to present. It's, it's the same as what it was two weeks ago, so I do have an amendment that I'd like to move. Um, and I can do so with, with, with an explanation. You're on your bill as amended. Thank you. Um, so as discussed your, last your time, oh, oh, I, almost. <laughs> um, do I want to move the amendment? Uh, do we want to get it on the floor? Yeah, you want to go ahead and move the amendment. All right, thank you. So this gets us to where exactly where I have wanted this to be uh, this whole time. Uh, the state authorizing legislation was intended to be a partnership between MDHA and the local, com uh, lo local uh, community. Um, I've achieved that. Um, of nine members on the Design Review Committee, seven are either Metro or local. Two are MDHA. Three I get to directly appoint. The other four are Metro department heads or their uh, uh, designees. Um, the urban design overlay. Ten years ago, my predecessor, Councilman Phil Claiborne, stood right here and through a very vigorous community process that I was engaged with as a neighborhood leader, we put together a future vision for our community called the Downtown Donaldson Urban Design Overlay. Ten years ago, envisioned a transit-oriented development area. We have the opportunity now here to put that state authorizing legislation in place that is a partnership between the local community and MDHA to make this happen. Um, and I, I would ask for your approval uh, and like to move the amendment. We have people in the queue. Council Member Van Rees. Was that on the last one? Okay. Councilman Mendez. I was meaning to speak on the bill after the amendment. We can so go back I, can, to I can wait. Okay. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of the amendment? All opposed? Motion passes. You're on your bill as amended. Uh, thank you. I'd like to uh, move approval um, with another brief comment. <laughs> Floor is yours. Thank you. Um, one thing I, I guess I'd mentioned, the UDO is really the guiding document, if you will. The TOD specifically says in the legislation, the TOD follows the UDO. They have to follow it. Uh, planning can, can confirm that. Um, if we make changes to the UDO, 
TOD has to follow it. So this is not MDHA's plan. This is not MG MDHA's agenda. This is Donaldson's plan. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Mendez, did you want to speak? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, first, I, I, I do want to um, thank uh, Councilman Syracuse. Um, he's put, uh, as he's talked about, um, uh, you know, a decade worth of effort into helping um, Donaldson develop. Unfortunately, this is the wrong plan um, and, uh, and simply needs work. Um, I'll, I'm going to go into some detail, but the bottom line is that this uh, does nothing but serve to suck money out of Metro's operating budget, and um, we all know that that's uh, how we got to where we are today. Um, there's, there's two main problems with this. First, um, planning, as it, at the request of um, the, the mayor's affordability and transit task force about eight months ago, um, did a uh, survey of affordable units in the area immediately surrounding this district. And the survey said that 90% of the housing in the immediate area around this 145 acres is currently qualifying as affordable. Um, and so there really isn't a, a need um, at that point for affordability, and there's absolutely no dollars whatsoever in this plan to do any preservation of existing affordable units. Um, on the money part, um, this does nothing more than intentionally um, accelerate $300 million worth of new development in exchange for Metro getting absolutely nothing in return for operating revenue. This, um, it's important to understand that this is a, a radically different idea of tax increment financing that we've ever done in the city before. Every existing redevelopment district gets the tax revenue from single parcels of property that are associated with loans. This is different in that it would take all the tax increment from 145 acres and in order to uh, make us feel better about that radical change, the statement in the plan, the statement in the plan you're being asked to approve is that MDHA would only need 30% of the new tax revenue to pay the TIF loans. But if you dig into the financial assumptions behind that, it's, it's, they're just radically flawed. And I've, I've talked about it before, but the bottom line is when I, when I first got the financial assumptions in um, June, and I, I think actually Councilman Cooper got them, um, it's clear on its face that the assumptions are wrong. Um, and as I've dug further, I got an alternative explanation on the assumptions uh, a week ago and when I pointed out how those are wrong, I got yet a third set of financial assumption back up today. Um, and uh, really just a cursory view of the tax assessor's website indicates the flaws there. Um, this is a, a, a gross overstatement of what's gonna happen and Metro will not get operating revenue um, for at least a decade to come. Um, and so this is real world consequences. You know, we heard um, N MNPS talk during the budget process about how every year they have to cough up a certain amount of revenue that would otherwise go to them and the line item in the budget is transfer to MDHA. This district alone, using MDHA's own numbers, will cause, after 10 years, an additional $1.35 million per year to have to be transferred from MP MNPS to MDHA for these development loans. If we're gonna expand these districts all over the city, a dozen of them, more than a dozen of them, every major corridor, we cannot um, give away all the tax increment for development loans. We have to leave some meat on the bones for Metro, otherwise we just dig a deeper hole on the operating budget. Again, I respect all the work um, that Councilman Syracuse has put into this. I worked on the affordable housing piece of it for um, six months myself, um, and uh, at the end of the day, the numbers don't work. It just digs a deeper hole for Metro on the operating budget, and, and this is, as strongly as I feel, I've felt about any money thing we've done in three years, we should vote no. Thank you. Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. On, on the basis of those comments, and, and yeah, I think this is a case where, um, you know, this, this, is a, this is a double dose of credit, right? I think uh, Councilman Syracuse has, has labored in Donaldson the entire time. I've even been aware of the phrase hip Donaldson uh, we have known multiple people in common who have been doing great work in Donaldson, and I, I absolutely trust his instincts uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, sort of that idea of, of the right plan for Donaldson. 
by the same token, I know that uh, we came into office in this term with, uh, you know, a number of people, um, I think, taking a second look at TIF and how it was applied. And, and I applaud Councilman Mendez for really uh, taking the lead on an effort to, to reevaluate that. And I know he's got uh, something that we just uh, reviewed on first reading that would um, create a, a study and formulating committee. And it's hard for me to uh, just casually overlook that as, as much as, you know, as someone who has been uh, first an advocate on the, the front of transit and then um, moved deeper into the policy via Nashville MTA board and having been very uh, involved in multiple rounds of, of extensive conversations about how best to do transit and move policy forward. I think conceptually, uh, this is the right thing. Um, you know, even absent, let's move Nashville as a specific implementation of a, of a citywide transit plan. I think it makes sense in certain areas to consider doing transit oriented development. Uh, we've got the first one in the state uh, that is is just opening at Hamilton Springs. Uh, and it, you know, it's, it's, it shows that you can do this type of policy uh, without necessarily having all of the T that would be uh, potential for successful match of transit with development. Uh, and so I guess I, in observing all that, I'd, I'd love to get a comment from Metro Finance on, uh, I guess, the validity of, of whether it's it's MDHA's assumptions or uh, whether they agree with the uh, the kind of analysis that suggests that uh, we will be in fact digging a, a deeper fiscal hole. Thank you. Someone from the finance want to speak, Mr. Harmon. Thank you, Vice Mayor, and thank you, Councilman. Um, finance met with MDHA um, as, as this conversation was going on. Um, they presented to us the historical data from their redevelopment districts as well as um, the county at large. Um, so we understood kind of where they were or the numbers that they were basing their model on. Um, and, and so we, we walked through that, uh, that model with them um, and the assumptions that they were making. Um, I think there have been some questions that have been raised, um, but in terms of um, estimating uh, the, the revenue from uh, MDHA and from these redevelopment districts, we have to rely on them uh, to some degree uh, because they have the expertise in these redevelopment districts over over these last several years. I'm sorry, I, I turned myself off there. Um, I guess a, a follow up there is then, you know, okay, if we are then to trust the uh, the MDHA analysis, then are, are you saying that the position of Metro Finance is in fact that this is not, um, you know, jeopardizing uh, future revenues that we would need for uh, our operating budget given the scale of development that's going to occur in Donaldson. I'm sorry. Could, could you repeat the question again? Sure. I I think if we if we take at face value the assumptions um, that that MDHA has used, uh, you know, kind of to justify this this particular implementation of TIF, I guess is is the position of Metro Finance that this would in fact not jeopardize Metro's fiscal position over over a decade or longer horizon, um, you know, on the basis of, of the road we've already traveled. I, uh, you know, I, I'm not taking Councilman Mendez's concerns lightly. I think if we are going to be doing infrastructure and related development at scale, I'd like to make sure that the, you know, we are getting the, um, the increase in overall revenues that would support Metro's operating budget over the long term. And so I guess I'm asking Metro Finance, are you, are, are you 
sufficiently satisfied with both those assumptions and Metro's uh, fiscal projections that this is not going to be a risk. Councilman, I don't know that I couldn't say that there's that there's not risk. There's always risk. Um, um, I think MDHA would tell you that there's always risk in the model. Um, obviously, uh, we're going to continue to uh, get the revenue that's that's coming out of that district now, right? Um, and then for the period of the uh, the increment. Um, should there be, um, you know, the, the, the increase, what creates the increment, we're not going to get that. Um, in, in terms of that jeopardizing the, the whole budget, I, you know. Now, I guess maybe another way of saying that is, are you comfortable with both those assumptions and, and Metro Finance's overall projections of what our operating needs are going to be? To my knowledge, yes, sir, we are. Thank you. Councilman Shulman. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so, uh, Mr. Jameson, I think this is for you. Um, looking at the uh, analysis on the bill, um, historically, MDHA has served two different purposes. Um, according to this, implement the development operational low income housing and implement economic development re redevelopment districts. Um, but then it says that this is kind of something else that they're now doing. So, exactly what is this? Why um, is so this is something that they've never done before? It's a, it's a new animal. It's uh, authorized under state legislation uh, for transit-oriented development. Once they determine that an area is transit deficient, then it becomes eligible in the same way that you would for uh, r classic redevelopment districts determine an area to be blighted. Um, and this is wholly and separate apart new state legislation that was adopted uh, a year and a half ago, and this would be the first ordinance under that state legislation. So under that legislation, that if I'm reading this right, authorizes transit-oriented redevelopment plans in areas where the absence of facilities for high-capacity transit options are detriment detrimental to public welfare. That's what allows this to happen. That's the enacting legislation. That is correct. Okay, so I'm, I'm going back to something that uh, Mr. Mr. Harmon was trying to analyze uh, something about what MDHA had said. But um, if you're looking at um, the second page of the analysis, it says MDHA has examined the area and concluded that it lacks facilities for high capacity transit options to the detriment of public health and welfare. So, so is this the situation where the statute says that they can only do it in certain areas. MDHA is one of the groups that can do it, but then they get to analyze it themselves and determine it themselves? That's correct. All right, so, so we're counting on them to obviously indicate financially that, that they think this is a good idea, but they also get to make their own determinations as to whether they want to do it. That's There's right. not an outside group that does it. They do it themselves. That's correct. I mean, that's it's the council that decides that. It's the council that votes on that, but that is MBHA's assessment. Okay. Um, last question. Um, we obviously got a um, council members got a series of emails from folks um, on both sides, but there was this question about affordable uh, affordable housing, um, and I'm not sure if this may have to go back to the sponsor. But there were questions. I think Councilman Mendez talked about it that um, this isn't going to do what we may think it's going to do in terms of affordability. I think there was concerns about the existing uh, housing around the area, and that actually might go up in value. We might be hurting that. At least that's what we were being told. Can anybody talk about that? Do we know? I mean, if this is such a, a, a process for affordable housing, and I know that the Councilman Syracuse has worked hard on this, but there is a concern about what people are saying, and that is, if we let this happen, we may not get in the end what we think we're going to get out of it. And that's probably not a fair question to you. All I know is that we did get hit with a series of emails that were saying um, this isn't going to do what it's supposed to do in the end. I, I, I can summarize, I think, both sides of the argument. Uh, MDHA is proposing that the $30 million generated, they would uh, dedicate $10 million for affordable housing with a cap of $15 million. Uh, that's essentially a new affordable housing. The concern on the other side has been what essentially are you doing for the preservation of existing affordable housing? 
uh, given the assessment the planning department has for that area. And there's a concern that it's not doing a sufficient amount to preserve or recognize the existing affordable housing and maintaining it. And, the, and that's just the analysis. There, there's no way of actually knowing exactly what's going to happen on this. One. I don't know. Okay. The sponsor may have more information. Right. Thank you, Madam President. Councilman Syracuse. Sure, thank you, Madam President. From a broad perspective, folks, when you when you look at the statistics that prove what happens when you develop along a any transit line, it becomes popular, property values go up, which is one of the substantiating factors as to why you want the TOD in place in the first place. When you start building multifamily housing, you want to start preserving that affordability for the, the term of, of, of the TOD. Um, as far as looking outside of the TOD and my neighbors that are in the single family neighborhoods that are not direct, they're not in the TOD, they're not in the UDO. Um, it goes to the question of any of our single family neighborhoods around Davidson County. How are we gonna preserve the affordability there? Um, but then there's also the argument that a lot of my neighbors are wanting this because it is going to increase the, their, their property value. So they're, they're encouraged by that. So why shouldn't somebody who, who built their home in, in the 50s and who, who's there now and it's been paid off for uh, 20 years, uh, they're going to get a substantial uh, increase in their property value. Why, why is that a bad thing? Um, sh should I be building a 100 foot wall around Donaldson and stop all development from happening at all? That, that's not fair to them. Councilman Cooper. Thank you, uh, Madam President. And very quickly here, I so appreciate Councilman Syracuse and his deep relationship with his community. But I want everybody here to hear Bob Mendez and his comments with Bob's longstanding advocacy for affordable housing. Note his view that this is not a good deal for the city and is not appropriate for our mission for more affordable housing. This is not the best way to get investment to Donaldson, which is a great goal, but it isn't. We should be a city and not just a bunch of redevelopment districts. And this is an important sentence. I'm gonna say it once slowly. Schools and your district will get less because developers are gonna get more. This is bad practice for the city. It's an incredibly inefficient way to bring investment to Donaldson by creating this class of middlemen to do what should be our work. Councilman Withers. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to sort of echo what Councilmember Syracuse has said. Um, if, if the existing affordability in Donaldson, I mean, unless those are um, apartment complexes or things like that, if, if they're single family homes, especially ranch homes that may have cost a certain amount in 1963 when the original homeowner who's still in there built them, uh, that is an affordable price for them today because they don't have a note on it. Um, but if, if those single family neighborhoods, uh, as Councilmember Syracuse said, are, are affordable today, um, there's nothing in place uh, with or without transit oriented development to ensure that they remain affordable because those houses could still be sold and redeveloped today with or, with, or, with or without that. Even if we were to put in, let's say, a conservation overlay that would prevent the demolition of those particular single family houses, that would still not ensure their affordability um, because as we know in Lachlan Springs, uh, which was an affordable neighborhood uh, some time ago, uh, those single family houses are very, very valuable today. Um, the affordability that we have in many of our neighborhoods, I'm thinking especially of East Nashville and also probably North Nashville, the affordability that we have didn't come from having programs to support affordable housing. It came from a half century or more often of disinvestment or in some areas of stagnation. Um, and unless we're gonna indicate to those neighborhoods that we're gonna continue to disinvest in you or to put things in your neighborhood that lower property value, then any development, including sidewalks or a library or any great thing is gonna enhance their property value. I know that our, our neighborhoods and some other areas of the county also want public investment. Um, what I heard, and I think a lot of us heard, uh, knocking on doors a couple of years ago and maybe even this year, is that we they feel, a lot of people feel that Metro has invested a lot or incentivized a lot downtown but not in neighborhoods. This is one of the few opportunities that we have to invest and incentivize good development in the neighborhoods and that we can actually tie affordable housing to it. 
development could happen without any affordability at all, and the price value appreciation of Donaldson homes can continue to increase out of affordable range with or without this, and probably will because it's becoming an increasingly well-known community. People who can't afford in East Nashville and other areas are going there or just discovering that it's a great place to live over in Donaldson. So that uh, appreciation is going to happen no matter what we do. What we can do is we can put in tools that do have a tie to affordability with the transit-oriented development um, with MDHA, which is the largest body in our county that has the experience and the capacity to build, preserve, and maintain affordable housing. I just think that's the only way we're going to get it. What you will have if you don't do this from an affordability standpoint is that the price of homes in Donaldson will actually just skyrocket anyway, and we will not necessarily have the good development. It will not be uh, transit-oriented. It will not be pedestrian-oriented necessarily. Um, I just think that all the things that we're trying to do are encompassed in this plan. Uh, we have heard from lots of homeowners in Donaldson who are very, very enthusiastic about this, um, and I think that, you know, frankly, if we can get homeowners in Donaldson to be excited about having affordable housing in their in their neighborhood, we should embrace that. Uh, I have a lot of constituents who say it's not enough. I'm just excited to hear we have lots of parts of the county that don't want any affordability or any additional affordability moving into their community. If we have a community that says, I think this is great that we're getting 10 percent, then we need to embrace that. Because while it's not 31,000 or whatever units, if we keep turning down every plan that it includes at least some affordability, we will never get any. So I'm planning on supporting this today, and I hope that my colleagues will too. Councilman Mendez. I'll keep this short. Um, the, I mean, honestly, the, the financial uh, part about this is, is, is nuts. Um, the area is 90% affordable according to planning's uh, professional analysis, and the plan is to take um, $40, $50 million worth of government money, dump it on the area to accelerate home values, and then build fewer affordable units than there are now. Um, and and that's, that's the logic of it. Um, but I want to get back to Mr. Harmon. I'm, I'm sorry, now that you got asked that question, I feel like I need to get it clarified. Do, does Metro Finance have any reason at all to believe that there will be any operating revenue that will come to Metro out of the dis this district for, say, the first decade? Um, Councilman, if I understood correctly, there was some mention by MDHA about the... the um, 30% being used to retire the debt and, and that there would be um, the remainder of that could could go back if they were just paying uh, to the debt. And, uh, and I, I hate to be difficult, but sure. I'm asking, does Metro Finance have any reason to believe that any operating revenue will come to this district from this district to Metro for the first decade? I would have to base that on the numbers that MDHA provided to us in and, that model. And you guys weren't even asked to do any analysis on that or even look at it till a couple weeks ago? That's correct. And and you, Metro Finance has no opinion one way or the other about whether those operating uh, revenue back to Metro assumptions are right or wrong? Right? I, 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 I mean, no, you not can say that it. I know of. You can not say that it. that I know of. All right, thank you. Councilman Bednay. Thank you. Uh, I hate tofu. My daughter is vegan and she wants me to eat tofu. I just won't eat it. But if I was starving, I'll eat tofu. And I think this is kind of what's happening with these TODs. We didn't want these TODs. We wanted to do the legislation we created like two, three years ago. The one we worked really hard that was going to be a comprehensive way to deal with helping people stay in their homes, build affordable housing citywide, not f concentrated poverty. But what ended up happening is we have three different ways of dealing with affordable housing. First of all, the people that say is that the market will take care of it will create situations like what Council Lady uh, Johnson has been trying to deal with, where they just build it what is cheap. You know, they concentrate poverty in the parts where the land is cheaper because they think we're just dealing with affordable housing, not just gentrification. It's just affordable housing. We'll build affordable housing in Nashville just by building where the land is cheap, and we'll take care of it, right? So that's plan A, market-driven. The market will take care of it. Plan B, transit-driven developments. We'll leverage transit 
and we'll build uh, all these developments along the corridors. We are creating uh, walking communities where people can use this transportation, and it creates all this development that it helps some of the developers make a bigger amount of money because how much money can you make building one house here, one house there, right? So now you're doing it with transit-driven developments. And then the, the last one is the one we tried to do, which was comprehensive, inclusive, dealing with all a variety of issues, preserving houses where they were, building new houses where they were needed, helping people stay on their homes, helping them build a ramp so they could age in place. That was overruled. I mean, the state killed that for us. We were not able to do it, right? So now we have either transit-driven developments or this so-called market-driven thing who has not built a single home. So the only thing we have is TOFU, is this transit-driven developments. So my problem with uh, TOFU, my daughter will kill me because she uh, wants me to eat it all the time. These TODs are the only thing we have now. So. My challenge here and my problem is what, what are we going to do to make it tasty, right? How are we going to cook this thing? And that's where I have a hard time with this uh, legislation. I'm still supportive of this concept of this transit driven area because it's the only thing we have left for us to build some of this affordability in the city. But I just don't like the taste of this particular one because at a philosophical level, at a very personal level, I believe that we the people, and by we the people, I mean the, the, the people, not somebody that works for the city, not an architect, although that's my background, not a professional, a technocrat, but the people should be in the majority deciding what gets built in their communities. And although Councilman Syracuse did an amazing amount of work trying to get MDHA to increase the number of people in that committee that will regulate how will that money be spent, we were not able to have a majority of residents. So if this is going to be replicated citywide, I just have a, a philosophical problem with the concept where we are giving up power. If this UDO is adjusted, it will be handled by the staff. It won't come to the council. We won't be voting on that. It'll be just administratively handled by the staff. That's what we were told at the meeting uh, yesterday. Was it yesterday? It seems like yesterday. So uh, that, that's, that's my biggest fear, that we are going to end up giving up our responsibility to decide how to do this. On the other hand, I mean, although I hear Councilmember Mendez and Coop, I'm done? Thank you. Oh, man, I was going to say something really fantastic. <laughs> okay. Councilmember Van Rees. Uh, respectfully, I call the question, please. All right, all those in favor of the question? Any opposed? Question prevails. We are on the bill, no, as amended, correct? As amended, correct. Um, yes. Okay, all those in favor, as amended? Aye. Opposed? No. Third reading, we'll do a machine vote. Everyone voted. Madam Clerk, please close the machine. 19 in favor, 15 against, one abstention. Bill passes. No, it doesn't. I'm sorry. It's 21. 21. Oh. Bill fails. Okay. 
Bill, Bill fails. fails. Required 21. Next is BL 2018-1142. Sponsor is Murphy. Amends the Metro Code to require notice to Metro Council members if fund request within the member's district. Just a minute. I'll get you in just a second, Council Member Murphy. There we go. Council Member Murphy, no. Huh. With, all, with all committee reports then, I move approval. Been moved and seconded, all those in favor? Any opposed? I have several members in the queue. I think you're left over from before we called the question. I'm gonna blank you out. Okay, next is BL 2018-1170, sponsor is Lee. Changes 6.03 acres from AR2A to SP zoning on property located at 12452 Old Hickory Boulevard to permit up to 53 residential units. Council Member Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. May I have committee reports? I believe they are all in. It was referred back to, okay. Um, I'm sorry, what do I need? Oops, I'm sorry, it was referred to planning. Council mm -hmm. Member Bedney. Thank you. We do need a committee report on 1170. Uh, yes, uh, and people were delighted to recommend it for approval, 1240 against. Thank you, Council Member Lee. Um, then I would uh, like to move it. Okay, is there a second? second? Been moved and seconded, all those in favor? Any opposed? Bill passes. Thank you. Next is BL Substitute Bill 2018-1202 as amended by Council Member Elrod. This amends the Metro Code to regulate operators of systems of shared mobility devices, such as bicycles and scooters, and to establish a permitting system for the same. Council Member Elrod. With committee reports in, I move approval on third and final reading. Is there a proposed amendment? Two. Several proposed amendments, okay. All right, Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I know we are on third reading here, uh, so I'd like to move to suspend the rules. Is there an objection to a suspension of the rules? Hearing none, Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I, uh, I believe uh, everyone should have in their packets uh, Amendment B on this that does two things that we had actually discussed mm -hmm. last time. Um, though I did have confirmation from one of the uh, platforms known to be coming to Nashville that they could do remote disabling of, of devices, um, I did not actually confirm that that was possible across all types of devices and found from another uh, potential platform that they did not have the capability of doing that for bikes. So we are gonna strike that provision right now uh, despite it being a recommendation of the NACTO guidelines, the amendment also, um, you know, per a concern expressed to me, last meeting reintroduces the concept of a sunset. I know this bill uh, throughout <coughs> describes itself as a pilot, um, but there's really no way to kind of, um, to seriously consider it that without it actually kind of saying, all right, it, it ends and then gets reintroduced as full policy later. Um, this is a piece that was um, very clearly uh, desired by uh, constituents and stakeholders that had been uh, most directly impacted by the introduction of the, the shared scooters when they were in Nashville in the first place. And I think this would serve us well as a, as a body in thinking about how we do pilots overall uh, from a policy standpoint, I think this is, is probably a legislative best practice that we should uh, seriously consider. So I would like to move Amendment P. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded. Council Member Elrod on the amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, President. Um, I'm uh, pose this uh, amendment and really because it is a pilot project um, in a number of ways. It gives a lot of guidelines uh, to the companies and to Metro about how the uh, the SUMDs will be uh, operating in Metro. Uh, it gives a lot of authority to the Traffic and Parking Commission, to the Traffic Li Transportation Licensing Commission, to Metro PD, to ITS as the data comes in and they um, sort through that and get it uh, um, in, a, in the most usable form. Um, and perhaps the most, uh, the biggest stick 
that is in the ordinance is a clause that says operators must comply with any ordinance uh, or resolution that this uh, Metropolitan Council passes. And that can include a, uh, a termination of the uh, program or any kind of changes to the program. So it is a pilot project, um, I would argue still in the sense whether or not it has a sunset provision, because it is something that while we have an initial authorization, it is still very much going to be operated on a regular basis, in some instances monthly, weekly, um, regulated and uh, by the commissions and departments that I just mentioned. So um, I'm in opposition to this because um, it'll be uh, basically we'll have to relitigate the entire program on a certain date when we can tweak it as we go along, um, which I believe is the uh, better process. And uh, at the last council meeting I committed, and I'll commit again now to you know, whatever kind of regular updates we need from the TLC or from the companies or from the community about how this program is going. Um, I'm committed to that. This is not something to set and forget. And I'll be talking about that more on once we get to the ordinance. Um, but that if we need to make tweaks as we go along, I'm committed to that. Um, particularly, I'm gonna talk to uh, uh, our council attorney to see about um, filing a placeholder ordinance, um, perhaps at the next meeting or the meeting after to get through first reading so that it will speed up any changes we need to make, um, whether it's um, you know, subs, you know, big or small that we need to make to this ordinance um, as uh, this program and the, uh, these operators roll out in Nashville. So I don't believe a sunset is needed because we can literally sunset it um, at any time with an ordinance from this council. So that's uh, my reason for opposition. Thank, Thank you. you. Council Member Sledge and Henderson, do you all wish to speak on this amendment? Yes. Okay. Council Member Sledge, you're recognized. I'm just I have to abstain on everything. That's okay. Make it a note. Duly noted. Uh, Council Member Henderson. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Uh, I rise in support of this amendment. I'm a co-sponsor of it. Um, it's in uh, your packet on page 59. I would encourage you all to give it a quick read, please. It says the provisions of this chapter shall expire and be null and void on October 1st, 2019, or 12 months after the adoption of this ordinance, whichever occurs later. Okay, the provisions of this chapter um, uh, can be um, uh, extended uh, by this council. And so I would just uh, ask colleagues, please, with all due respect to the sponsor and the good work that he has done, I am supportive of, of scooters in Nashville. I appreciate um, the various platforms and folks who have come to the table and, and worked uh, uh, work together on this. But I would ask us to really look at the uh, disruptive technologies like our short-term rentals and so forth, and I think as we reflect on that, do we not wish perhaps we had put a sunset on that? Um, again, respectfully to Councilman Elrod, um, this is a pilot in name only. Um, I know he is a, a man of his word, um, but that said, I, I really do feel that we need to codify this and get this in this ordinance, um, and so respectfully, I would ask your support of this sun prep provision that you can read in full on page 59 of your packet. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Johnson, do you wish to speak on the amend this amendment? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a question uh, on that sunset provi provision to uh, Mr. Jameson. If we adopt this sunset provision, and then, you know, if by any chance a pilot is work, uh, working very well and adopted the community, how do we extend or, uh, you know, uh, how do we change not to sunset in certain this uh, proposed day? By resolution, um, and there's no limit on when you would file the resolution. You could file it tomorrow, declaring this to be a success. As it's currently drafted, it does refer to it as being a pilot program, but the, the permits are for a year. And then after that, if you're an operator, you'd go back and get another permit. And the concern is, without a sunset provision, bringing this clause back to the body that adopted it, the lobbyists and attorneys are gonna descend on the Transportation Licensing Commission that has no wherewithal to deal with in the way that you've developed that expertise. The other concern about this is that there is a significant company that operates that needs the portion regarding disabling to be eliminated. They do not have that te technical capability. So if the amendment is defeated, you have a company that is by definition non-compliant with what is required. Thank you. Uh also, did we 
we have been through so many substitute and second substitute. Did we request that the report date from uh, the transportation uh, authority or you know how they are doing and so forth? Did we have in that certain date? I think at one point, uh, Council Member Barclay Allen was proposing a report to come back to council body. Right, in the previous uh, meeting, we adopted that, I believe. July 1 of next year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on the amendment? Council Member O'Connell. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I, I will just note again from, from the importance of a pilot standpoint for, for doing right by the citizens of Nashville, passing this certainly frees up uh, this technology to re-enter Nashville in a way that, um, you know, certainly a, a number of uh, both my constituents and I'm sure some also close to downtown will appreciate from a mobility standpoint. I will appreciate that. I know we've got bike pad advocates that are looking at this uh, eagerly from, you know, not just a, an availability of another mode, uh, but also uh, from the standpoint of, of possibly accelerating some improvements to infrastructure, and, and I share those goals and aspirations, but I've also got a, a group of constituents who uh, experienced this the first time out, and it was not a pleasant experience, and they continue to send me articles from around the country uh, that, uh, that show how this is creating not just quality of life, but safety issues around the country. I think we can probably do better than that. I give extraordinary credit to Councilman Elrod uh, for his work on this that has brought us into uh, almost full compliance with the, the NACDO uh, guidelines on this front. So I think we're gonna have one of the best policies that is actually out there in the country on this. But I think despite that, the, the, the effort on the policy front, I, I still think we are best uh, suited in, in thinking of this as a pilot and, and therefore the sunset provision I think is an important thing not just for my constituents but for Nashvillians anywhere that are concerned about some of the quality of life degradations that we have experienced as a city. So I would renew my motion. Thank you. Thank you. We're voting on the amendment B. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. We need a vote for it on the amendment. We need to go. Can we do a machine vote. Madam Clerk. We are voting on the amendment. Has everyone voted? Madam Clerk, can you close the machine? 12 in favor, 17 against, two abstentions. The amendment fails. Next, uh, was there one in, any other amendments? No, so Council Member Elrod. Thank you, Madam President. I do just want to speak briefly on um, Council Lady Mita Johnson's amendment. It was um, regarding um, the uh, use of motorized scooters on greenways. I think that's somewhat addressed in, in Metro Code, but if not, the TLC has full authority after this to regulate where they can operate. So I want to make that clear. Um, first of all, thank you to everyone that has put um, um, input and in a lot of hard work, uh, Metro Legal Public Works, Metro Planning, um, Walk Bike Nashville, uh, MNPD, uh, scooter and, and bike companies. Um, there's uh, many council members here on the floor um, and also presiding. Um, I just wanna thank you for your efforts with this um, because this is um, something that um, uh, there was a company that operated earlier in this year and, and no matter what you may think of how, how it operated, um, it was very popular um, with um, people visiting here to Nashville, but I think most importantly, um, riders and uh, people here in Nashville that were actually using it. And I think um, we've got a very strong ordinance that um, has a lot of carrot and a lot of stick, um, both in the ordinance, um, in a way that uh, Metro um, has a lot of authority to regulate um, this pilot project as it goes along in many, many different ways. But there's also a carrot to the companies that if they are good actors um, in the way that they operate as a company um, and with Nashvillians and in the community, 
And um, if their uh, products and vehicles are popular and being used, they can increase um, their numbers and uh, increase their operations. So as this uh, ordinance, uh, if it passes tonight, and I, of course, ask for your approval, that I think it's going to be incumbent on um, the companies to work with Metro as they go along. And I think there's already been some discussions on how to do that and how they'll be doing that um, going forward, I think particularly with, uh, you know, a lot of things that are in the ordinance um, and lessons learned um, previously. But I think that they want to work with Metro. Um, but I think it's also going to be incumbent upon um, the departments of departments and commissions of uh, Metro um, that they be willing to work with the companies that if these are popular, like I think many of us um, believe that they will to um, try to help make them work in Nashville and to um, not be um, uh, unnecessary uh, stumbling blocks and to work with them in good faith that so that they can um, operate and if they um, if they are uh, popular and good actors. So um, as this rolls along, I would ask that the companies work with Metro uh, quickly, and I would also ask that uh, the um, appropriate folks in Metro, the TLC, um, and uh, that this be signed quickly, and so that they can get on the streets, um, but in a proper manner, um, in a safe manner, that they're not blocking, uh, you know, sidewalks or you know parking on sidewalks um, illegally under this um, ordinance and I think that um, we're going to have I uh, need to have a lot more transportation options like this um, to address traffic congestion this is not by any means a silver bullet um, I don't think the interstates are all of a sudden going to um, part and but um, I think um, we're going to start embracing new transportation options like this uh, particularly from private companies um, and work with them in, a, in that private public private partnership um, with uh, Councilman Pardue calling the question, I uh, renew my motion. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't think I've heard him do that yet. Councilmember O'Connell, did you wish to speak again? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I think now that we are officially absent uh, an effective pilot mechanism, I mean, we are now the pilot, right? This, the word is in there, but it's no better than our ability to watchdog this uh, as a permanent part of the Metro Code of Laws now. I, uh, you know, I, I, I would say for all of that optimism and aspiration at, at this point, I, you know, I'm going to be looking to Chairman Elrod uh, to, uh, to uphold this as he is one of the people that worked to defeat the amendment that would create the effective pilot. And I, I really don't know uh, how to explain the, the absence of the, um, the piece that would have struck the, the requirement that we do uh, a remote kill switch effect for for operators. I mean, I, I would encourage them to explore that uh, from a technology standpoint, but I think that's that's something that we'll leave up to them and and just you know have to work with. Uh, I I will say I, I am concerned that we're not going to have enough serious conversations about this if if things do go sideways. But uh, you know I will be looking at. Chairman Elrod for his leadership on this and to the platforms to operate in uh, much better faith than, uh, than we had one operate the first time around. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Swope. Thank you, Madam Hotem. Uh, I want to stand in support of this the resolution, or excuse me, this bill, and I want to commend Chairman Elrod uh, and all the departments that he's worked with on this. Uh, you have managed to pull together a beautiful piece of legislation in a very short window of time, which having been around the world and seen what happens when free bicycles go unchecked and free scooters go unchecked, um, I am trusting that the legislation we've created here will be passed tonight and that the companies coming to town will work with TLC and with the other departments in town to make this not the mess that China can or has turned into or India has turned into, but rather we have a chance in Nashville through your leadership, Councilman Elrod, to create a model that everyone can look at, not just nationwide, but worldwide. And I think we have, a, again, a beautiful piece of legislation to start with. Is it perfect? Probably not. Nothing ever is. But I commend you on your effort, and I will absolutely support this, and I ask everyone else to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else in the queue, we are voting on the bill with no amendments. All those in favor? Yep. Any opposed? Need a machine vote.
Has everyone voted? Madam Clerk, please close the machines. 29 in favor, one against, two abstentions. Bill passes. Okay, we're on BL 2018-1229, Council Member Bednay changes 49 acres from AR 2A to SP zoning for properties located at 6397 Pettus Road and Pettus Road unnumbered, east of Nolansville Pike to permit 145 single family lots. Council Member Bednay. Yes, uh, committee reports, please. Would you like to give it? Yes, the committee recommended approval 1140 against and uh, I would like to move for a one meeting deferral if that is possible at this point. Uh, yes? Yeah. So I'll be uh, appreciated of all of you if you will support my humble request to have a one meeting deferral. Having been properly moved and seconded, your humble request, all, all in favor? Opposed? Your humble request is approved. Thank you. BL 2018-1245, Council Member Sledge and O'Connell applies a neighborhood over conservation overlay district of 42.96 acres for various properties along South Street, Villa Place, Wedgwood Avenue, 15th Avenue South, Tremont Street, Nedge Hill Avenue, north of Wedgwood Avenue. Council Member Sledge. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Committee report, please. Council Member Bednay. The committee recommended approval 1140 against. Councilmember Sledge. Thank you. We're going to defer one meeting with a brief explanation, if that's all right. The um, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so Councilman O'Connell and I have been working with um, community members kind of on both sides of this uh, discussion. Uh, we are working with historic uh, staff regarding guidelines. Um, and so we are having good conversations about that. A lot of good email questions going back and forth right now. So we just want a little more time to work on it. Um, we heard from members that wanted to see that as well. So. That is what we're doing. So we're deferring one meeting, please. Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. This is this has been um, a very lengthy conversation within the Edge Hill neighborhood. I know uh, many of you received uh, Representative Love's letter. Uh, you know, you you have received correspondence from. Uh, John Feldhacker, who spoke during the public comment period tonight about um, Edge Hill UMC. Uh, and and you also saw that this is a community that uh, that has some divisions, but I think uh, leadership of, of both sides have recognized uh, concerns expressed by members of council, and I think on a neighbor to neighbor basis, understand the importance of kind of taking a deep breath. And I will tell you that through the weekend, um, after a, a small group meeting with leadership, we already have. Uh, what was a, a rough uh, idea, kind of a framework for some proposals that could uh, potentially serve to create a better overall product. Uh, those have now been submitted along with some important questions from residents uh, to Metro Historic. Uh, we've got this conversation uh, prepared to move forward productively, and I look forward to coming back uh, for third reading on September 4th uh, with a, a better bill. Thank you. Thank you. Council Lady Hurt. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I just wanted to stand and thank Councilman Sledge and Councilman O'Connell for the hard work that they've done uh, to really work through this. Uh, I've met with quite a few and spoken with quite a few of the residents, and for them to really go through this and come up with something that would be beneficial for all concerned makes me very happy and I just wanted to compliment them for the great work that they've done. Thank you. Seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1253, Council Member Pardue changes 40.15 acres from CS to IWD zoning for property located at Edenwald Road no unnumbered east of Gallant and Pike. Council Member Pardue. Hang on, hang on. I get it open. There we go. Okay. I think we have a committee report. Councilman Bednay. Uh, call the question. I'm sorry. Uh, the committee recommended approval 1140 against. Councilman Pardue. Uh, well, that 
so humbly being said, I move the bill. Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Opposed, motion passes. BL 2018-1254, Councilmember Scott Davis changes 0.21 acres from SP to R6A zoning for property located at 869 Joseph Street. Councilman Scott Davis. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Committee reports, please. Councilman Bedney. The committee recommended approval, 11-4-0 against. Councilman Davis. Move for approval, please. Having been properly moved and seconded, all in favor? Good. Opposed? Motion yeah. passes. BL 2018-1268, Councilmember Hager changes 276.49 acres from R6 to RS5 zoning and from R10, R15, and AR2A to RS10 zoning for properties along Warren Drive, Hiller Drive, Hickman Street, Hickerson Street, Keaton Avenue, Scenic View Boulevard, Shelby Street, Hillman Place, Rayon Avenue, Ensley Avenue, Swinging Bridge Road, and Newell Avenue. Councilmember Hager. Committee reports, please. Councilman Bedney. The committee uh, recommended the substitute and approve a substitute uh, 12 4 0 against. Councilman Hager. Also, I'm asking to uh, suspend the rules because I've got one amendment, but there's one property where I had uh, wasn't listed on there that wanted to opt out of the RS zoning. So I'm moving to suspend the rules to amend the substitute bill to add this piece of property in there. So um, is there any opposition to a suspension of the rules? Seeing none, the floor is yours. All right, then I move the amendment. Councilman Shulman. No. Okay. <laughs> I move to amend. Okay, having been properly moved and seconded on the amendment, all in favor? Could I please ask everybody to take their seat? Move, move to, um, and I guess I need to get that property address. Well, I was going to ask you for the address, yeah. 149 Scenic View Road. And this is to be opted out? That will be opted out of the RS, which is uh, parcel 0430-400-4900. Thank you. I give it the parcel also. Seeing no one in the queue to speak on the amendment, all in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. You are on your bill as amended. Move to pass the bill as amended, please. Councilmember Shulman. Thank you, Madam President. I just uh, want to rise and say that um, I, I appreciate what uh, the councilman is doing, Councilman Hager, um, shows that he works very, very hard for his constituents. and I. Uh, this has been a tough one. So, and and I, I even took the ones out that objected to it, and I said I told them I would do that, and I did. Thank you very much, Council Lady Dow. I have a point of order. I um on our vote. Uh, let me give you the bill number. I want to make my vote recorded as a yes. On this bill? You, no, 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 no. Oh. Well, let's get through with okay. this bill, oh, and I then thought we, we were can come done. Right back. Sorry, it's been a long. Night. Yeah, we're not done yet. <laughs> So, Council Member Hager, do you want to move your bill as substituted? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Move the bill as substituted. I'm sorry. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Council Lady Dow. Okay, I have to find the number. I'm sorry. I just want to uh, make sure my I, my I voted no, but I voted on the wrong thing, and I just want to change my vote to a yes, and it's on. Uh, the, I was no on the amendment and yes on the bill, on the bird scooter. Okay, will you do me a favor? Will I'll you come up it. here well, and address okay, I will. up here I will. and then, then we'll deal with it? Okay, thank you. BL 2018-1269, Councilmember Kendall changes 1.45 acres from OL to MULA zoning for property located at 511 27th Avenue North and to rezone from OL to RM20A zoning for properties located at 514, 516, and 518 27th Avenue North and 2700 Delaware Avenue. Councilman Kendall and I believe Mary Carolyn. Council Lady Roberts, you've got that. Oh, you're on his. Oh, okay. There you go. You're fine. Thank you. Committee reports, please. Councilman Bedney. The committee recommended approval 11 4 0 against. Council Lady Roberts. With all committee reports in, I'd like to move for approval, please. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? 
Motion passes. BL 2018-1270, Councilmember Anthony Davis changes 1.38 acres from CL, R6, and R10 to MULA zoning for properties located at 1528, 1528B, 1528C, 1530 Riverside Drive, and 1609 Porter Road. Councilmember Anthony Davis. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Do I have a committee report on this, or is it? Yes, you do. It? Councilman Bednick. I was asking Councilor Johnson why she was still here. Uh, the committee recommended approval 11 4 0 against. Councilman Davis. Thank you. I'll move approval. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018 1271, Council Lady Blaylock approved with conditions, disapproved without, by the Planning Commission amends 1.28 acres from RS10 to SP zoning for property located at 291 Tusculum Road to permit a two family residential use. Council Lady Blaylock. Committee reports, please. Councilman Bednay. Committee recommended approval 11 4 0 against. Council Lady Blaylock. Move for approval, please. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1272, Councilman Bednay amends 5.65 acres of a specific plan for properties located at 6444 and 6438 Pettus Road and on a portion of properties located at 6424 and 6434 Pettus Road to permit the modification of layout and access points. Councilman Bednay. Committee report. Would you like to give it? Yes, the committee recommended approval 1140 against. Floor yours. And, and uh, I need to move an amendment. And so I am hoping that you all will support this housekeeping amendment, please. Having been properly moved and seconded, seeing no one in the queue, all in favor? Opposed? You're on your bill as amended. And now I'm requesting uh, your support by uh, approving my motion to approve this legislation. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. We are on BL 2018-1273, Council Member Rosenberg amends 1.76 acres of a specific plan for properties located at 7860 Learning Lane and 8236 Collins Road to permit a self-storage facility. Council Member Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam President. Move to turn the temperature up about five degrees, please. No kidding. A committee report, please. Councilman Bednick. Um, he didn't ask me about the temperature, so we can have a debate about that, but the committee recommended approval. Thank you. Floor is yours. Um, uh, this uh, was met with, I was surprised by the support for this bill. It speaks to the work that the applicant did with the neighborhood, the nearby school and businesses before I got involved. Um, move approval. Councilmember O'Connell, you wish to speak on this? Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. I, I, this is a question for the sponsor. Just, are, are we sure Title 17 applies out in District 35? <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a question for Council Jamison, but we can use a ranked choice voting method to, de to decide how we want to go about deciding this bill. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1274, Council Member Hastings changes 1.0 acres from R6 to MUNA zoning from property located at 2608 Old Buena Vista Road. Council Lady Haywood. I think all committee reports are in, is that correct? No, we have a council, we have a committee report from oh. Councilman Bednay. Go Bednay. The committee recommended approval, 11 4 0 against. Council Lady Haywood. Okay, move for approval. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018 1275, Councilmember Anthony Davis applies 1.37 acres of a historic landmark overlay for property located at 1431 Shelton Avenue. Councilmember Anthony Ooh. Davis. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'll uh, do committee report. I actually wanted to take these two together if that's possible. 75 and 76. Okay. Who has a point of order? Council Lady Johnson. I can't hear you. I'd like to request to take uh, those bills separately, please. We, we, we can do that. I just need to do, in that case, the neighborhood landmark overlay first. So we'll take 1276 first. Yes. 
Okay, BL 2018-1276 applies 1.37 acres of a neighborhood landmark overlay district for property located at 1431 Shelton Avenue. Councilman Davis. Thank you, I will do committee report on that one. Councilman Bednay. The committee recommended approval 10 for two against. Councilman Davis. Uh, move approval with brief comment. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, just wanted to mention, uh, I know it's late, so I won't speak long, just a quick uh, kind of summary here. Uh, thank you to all the input on this. Uh, I've had neighbors uh, weighing in on this for a couple months now and uh, have had good neighbors on both sides, though the vast majority in Inglewood have been for this. Um, we had a good public process. We did two public meetings on this with uh, again, the vast majority in support, especially in the immediate area of Ivy Hall. Um, good committee discussion today as well. The packet on your desk addresses uh, the benefits of this uh, and a lot of the questions that have been raised. Um, first off, Ivy Hall is a very unique, very historic property. Uh, and both of these uh, ordinances will help protect it. Uh, with the site plan, the property won't be able to be subdivided. Uh, and with the historic overlay, of course, that was a big, uh, which is the next ordinance, a give back to the neighbors, which puts a review on the entire exterior of this property. Um, regarding, so I want to address a couple of things. Regarding um, commercial, again, from, from planning, uh, the purpose of a neighborhood landmark overlay is to permit uses not permitted by base. So I did want to put that out there. Uh, that is the original purpose of them. Uh, we have permitted many of these neighborhood landmark overlays. And again, if we wanted to have a broader conversation about these overlays, I think we could do that uh, at some time, and, and maybe it is time to address that. Uh, There's so many of them, though, in town. Uh, the Russell Street Church, uh, Cowboy Jack Clement, Clement's home on Belmont, the Dalebrook Church, Maybell Carter, Hank Snow, uh, Old School Farm to Table, and the list goes on. Um, again, I welcome a broader conversation, but I just want to uh, say that this is the right thing for Inglewood uh, as a local zoning matter. Uh, I think we, we had a really good process on this, and I hope that you'll vote for it. And if there's any questions, um, I'm happy to discuss further, but we did have a good discussion in committee. And as you see, the Planning Commission and our Planning Committee has uh, recommended approval. Thank you. Thank you. Council Lady Van Rees. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to uh, comment because in the packet that uh, came in, uh, there was a mention of Hank Snow's Rainbow Ranch Studio. I just wanted to clarify that um, Rainbow Ranch, as it's known, over on East Marthona and Madison is actually a museum and short-term uh, lodge for visitors. Uh, the museum consist of Hank's uh, former office and former studio. There's actually not an active recording studio inside the building. It's just the room where it used to be. Um, so I wanted to clarify that since it was uh, incorrect on the letter. Um, but it also contains uh, the barn where his beloved horse Shawnee lived and is buried next to. So I just wanted to make sure that um, uh, Joey had a reason for staying out so late that uh, Shawnee the horse is buried at Hank Snow's farm. Just mention that. Um, uh, and I believe that it's important to, to acknowledge that it's owned and managed by his uh, grandnephew out of Canada and that uh, that is a non-residential use of a neighborhood uh, landmark uh, overlay as well as a landmark, uh, historic landmark. Uh, in addition to that, of course, the Smith Carter House, uh, also known as uh, the Maybell Farm, is a private residence and future uh, active uh, use is planned at the, at the barn, such as weddings and small concerts. Uh, both of these situations, uh, in talking with the neighbors, uh, both, uh, both of these in the Madison uh, area, um, take pride in the fact that the uh, musical heritage of Madison is retained by being able to have a historic landmark overlays in place uh, so that the folks um, using um, and taking care of those homes have a, a, a means to be able to um, uh, properly uh, care for them. And uh, those non-residential uses are in place in residential areas. So. Um, I wanted to just clarify that because the letter was 
somewhat incorrect. And of course, to share with you that Shawnee is resting well. Thank you. Councilman Withers. There we go. Thank you, Madam President. I know there has been a lot of discussion about um, commercial prol proliferation in neighborhoods, particularly as we had with short-term rentals. Just one, you know, the, the difference with short-term rentals, for instance, is that um, that is a use where someone goes and gets a permit. The neighborhood has no say. There's no public hearing in that uh, for that particular property, whereas the neighborhood landmark, there is a public hearing before planning as well as council. Usually it then goes back to planning. What I think uh, I want to congratulate my colleague on is that he has um, resolved some of the uncertainty that sometimes happens with a neighborhood landmark um, when the council approves a neighborhood landmark ordinarily, uh, such as for a property on Russell Street in East Nashville, that council approved the neighborhood landmark overlay all the way back in 2001. Um, I was only able to find a site plan that most people agreed to a few months ago. So there can be a lot of uncertainty and I really want to just congratulate my colleague on going ahead and getting that site plan uh, included into this amendment so that folks know what the use is and also congratulate him on the amount of uh, neighbor support uh, that uh, we witnessed for this use. It wasn't 100%, but it's quite a bit. Um, I know all of us on the council value our constituent input and just want to, again, say that this isn't just random things that are going to pop up in neighborhoods. It's a rigorous process to get approval from historic even to qualify for that. Um, and then there are still is a public hearing process, which we have today. So I am in support of this one and encourage my colleagues to also support it. Thank you. Councilman Mendez. Call the question. You were the last one in the queue. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Machine vote. I do, I do need to know which, which motion we're voting on. I can't hear you. Which motion? 1276. The motion for the question or the motion to approve? Motion to approve. Okay. He was the last one in the queue. I didn't have to call for the question. Madam Clerk, you can close the machines. Tally the vote. Okay. You want to say? That's a question for Mr. Dan. Twenty-five, thirty. We need to reset it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can she reset it and do it again? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna vote one more time because we had a computer glitch. So she's gonna reopen the machines and we're gonna do it one more quick time. Okay, you can close the machine, please, and tally the vote. 26 in favor, four against, one abstention. Motion passes. We are on BL 2018-1275. Councilman Anthony Davis applies 1.37 acres of a historic landmark overlay for property located at 1431 Shelton Avenue. Councilman Anthony Davis. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Committee report. Councilman Bedne. 11-4-0 against. Councilman Davis. This one being the uh, historic landmark overlay, I would simply move approval. Thank you. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. 
BL 2018-1277, Councilman Sledge changes 0.38 acres from R6 to MULA zoning on property located at 358 Glenrose Avenue. Councilman Sledge. Thank you, my Vice Mayor Committee report. Councilman Bednay. Uh, yes, the committee recommended approval, 11-4-0 against. Councilman Sledge. I'll move approval. Have been properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1278, Councilmember Sledge. Changes 0.39 acres from RS5 to MULA zoning from properties located at 2207, 2209, 2211, and 2211B Foster Avenue. Councilmember Sledge. Uh, thank you, committee report. Councilman Bednay. Yes, the Planning Historical uh, Commission Committee recommended approval 11-4-0 uh, against. Councilman Sledge. I move approval. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1280, Councilman Hastings approves the plans for a non-hazardous liquid waste processing facility to be located at 2832 Wise Creek Pike, Councilman Swope. I'm, I'm hoping for a delightful committee report. Councilman Bednick. I'm sorry, Councilman Elroy. Public Works recommended a one meeting deferral with a re-referral to the Public Works Committee. Six in favor, zero against. Councilman Swope. And at the request of the sponsor, Councilman Hastings, I'm asking for a one meeting deferral. Councilman Shulman. Thank you, Madam President. Just real quick, uh, Mr. Jamison, I know this, uh, we're operating, I think, under the Jackson Law. Are there some time frames involved with this? Are we okay with deferring one meeting? Okay, if we do it by September 4th, yes. Okay, which will be the in time for the next meeting. Correct. Okay, thank you. Councilman Swope. Move approval. All in favor? Opposed? Well, move approval on the deferral on for deferral. one meeting. It's on the deferral. <laughs> we are moving approval on a one meeting deferral. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion Aye. passes. Aye. BL 2018 1282, Council Members Mendez, Bertrand, and Pridemore amends the Metro Code to establish a new section regarding appraisals of real property prior to disposition. disposition. Council Member Mendez. All committee reports being in, move approval. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018 1284, Council Members Kendall, Virtor, and others authorizes the Department of Water and Sewer Services to provide public water service improvements for region homes, proposed development, as well as other existing properties in the area. Council Member Roberts. With all committee reports in, I'd like to move for approval. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1285, Council Members O'Connell, Bednay, and Elrod abandons a portion of alley number 572 right-of-way. Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Madam President. Move approval. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. BL 2018-1286, Council Members Syracuse, Bednay, and Elrod abandons a portion of Cliffdale Road right-of-way. Council Member Syracuse. All our reports are in. Move approval. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. If there's no other business before the council, is there a motion to adjourn? All in favor? We are adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov. Thank you.